Oh good, you're awake. It's time for the second part of Dry Dock episode 291. Let's get on with question. John M asks, what were the biggest differences between the US Navy's patrol craft and sub chasers? Were they essentially the same thing but designated differently? The Eastern and Caribbean sea frontiers were problem areas of submarine activity, and a good concentration of both were stationed in those areas. Were they effective and worth the cost and manpower of staffing? I understand that some patrol craft and submarine chasers were in both the Atlantic and Pacific combat areas, and did any actually serve in fleet, task force, or task group formations? And what, if any, were the English, Jap Japanese, German, or Italian equivalents, and if there were similar craft, were they successfully employed by those nations? There doesn't seem to have been a hard and fast rule about what exactly was a sub chase and what exactly was a patrol craft, because you have vessels like this you see uh, sc661 which are classified as submarine chasers and have the sc hull number which is submarine chaser you then have slightly bigger versions which are called submarine chasers still officially but use pc or patrol craft as a hull designator and then you have bigger ones still which are designated as patrol craft and use the patrol craft designator so there, there is a bit of overlap, but broadly speaking, submarine chasers seem to be smaller vessels suited basically for coastal work. They might have a long range, but so by coastal work, I don't necessarily mean they're short range, but I mean, they're not the kind of thing you necessarily want to risk a transatlantic crossing on. Let's put it that way. Um, and the ones that are absolutely definitely pure submarine chasers also don't seem to be particularly heavily armed, as you can see with this one. Yeah, there's a few machine guns and auto cannons and so forth, but its job seems to be it's just to chase, well, as the name suggests, to chase down and destroy submarines and chuck explosives at them. Whereas once you get into the full patrol craft, and to a certain degree the submarine chasers that carry the PC hull designator, they're much more heavily armed for a surface role, which, I mean, they're, they're still not going to fight off pretty much anything in the terms of a serious service radar, but with things like a three-inch deck gun, they can put up a degree of resistance to aerial threats. And the largest of the patrol craft, you're know, talking you know, something that's in the region of seven to 800 tonnes or more, those are the kind of things where you might actually start thinking about using them on convoy escort in the deep ocean because at that point that they're approaching the size of a corvette and in fact in most other navies probably would be corvettes so yeah i would say if you're looking for a, the a big difference between a officially designated patrol craft and an officially designated submarine chaser it's the patrol craft is larger more heavily armed and probably capable of oceanic escort if you had to but being the us they have destroyer escorts for that kind of thing um in terms of were they effective and worth the cost of manpower staffing well <laughs> the the part of the problem is in determining their effectiveness they're obviously as you said mostly concentrated around the us coast but the time that the U-boats are really operating off the U.S. coast is also the time when U.S. anti-submarine warfare is in its infancy. So if you compare number of hulls and deployed and number of patrols undertaken with number of U-boats sunk, they can look relatively ineffective. But the flip side is, you know, if you'd put fleet destroyers or whatever on those patrols, they probably would have been about as ineffective because the issue was more the anti-submarine warfare technique, not the vessels themselves obviously a very small sub chaser like this that lacks something like a hedgehog launcher which some of the larger ones had is going to have fundamental issues with with not having as wide a range of anti-submarine equipment but that's just a function of size not necessarily a function of the role as a as a particular designation i don't think any of them really served in 
the various fleets uh, on the front line, mostly because the small ones would have been not capable of surviving long deployments in the middle of the Pacific, also wouldn't have had the range to do so. And for the bigger ones, well, you could just get a lot more capability out of a destroyer escort, which also usually was a little bit quicker and therefore could actually keep up with the fleet, which is rather important. So as far as I'm aware, no significant patrol craft or submarine chaser formations were found on the front lines. They might have deployed one or two beyond the coast of the United States, but you know when you've got an American fast carrier task group wandering around off the Japanese coast, you're extremely unlikely to find a patrol craft or a sub chaser tagging along. Were there other nation equivalents? Yes, the Japanese had their own kind of several hundred ton sub chasers, as did the Germans, as did the Italians. The British tended to have a little bit more of a split. They had motor launches, which tended to be more on the realm of the the sub chaser end of displacement, and then you kind of went straight up to a corvette or similar. Although some of the British motor launches um, and MGBs did start to get a little bit large, uh, but they were mostly used for hunting uh, e-boats or Schnellboote, I suppose if you want to use the German designation. Uh, the, the British generally, at least in World War II, would prefer to use something like a corvette or a frigate to go after subs than a small coastal craft, but usually you'd find most motor launches and the larger of the motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats would usually carry a depth charge or two just in case. And on all sides, those small submarine chaser equivalents did claim victims. The main advantage of them is, of course, they're easy to mass produce and don't require too many people to man, so you can have them everywhere. Uh, their main disadvantage is that most of them can be outrun by a submarine if it surfaces, and the smaller of them can also probably be outfought in a gun duel if it comes down to that, at least if it's a one-on-one. -on -one. And they don't tend to have particularly large reserves of anti-submarine weaponry, like depth charges, purely as a function of their size. So if you have a submarine chaser come after you as a, as a submarine captain, you've got a much, much better chance of just outlasting them as compared to if you have a, you know, a proper escort corvette size, destroyer escort size or above. Brett McDowell asks, was there any effort to salvage and repair the Royal Oak? And if not, why not? Was the water too deep? Was the ship too badly damaged? It seems to me the ships at Pearl Harbor were more damaged, but managed to make it back into service. Uh, could you also briefly go into the Royal Oak mutiny of the 20s? I can't find a ton of information that makes sense. Very briefly, the Royal Oak quote -unquote, mutiny was essentially the three senior most officers, including an admiral on the ship, just having an epic falling out and not being able to deal with it properly like adults, and essentially acting like a bunch of petulant children with wounded pride, which just spiralled until it got out of hand to the point that they were all taken off of the ship. Um, now, as for Royal Oak salvage, no, it wasn't ever really seriously contemplated. The thing you've got to remember is where and how Royal Oak sank. So comparing it to Pearl Harbor, Royal Oak sank in deeper water. Now, Scapa Flow is a deep water anchorage. Admittedly, it's not massively deep. It's not like ocean abyssal plain deep. But then when we come and look at closer at the Pearl Harbor survivors, West Virginia, for example, probably the single most damaged ship that was actually salvaged and returned to service, sank upright and was still partially above water. Royal Oak was fully submerged, and even the absolute highest point of the wreck is still you know, 15 to 20 feet below the water level. So that complicates things for a start, because it means the lower part of the wreck are actually beyond safe diving limits with normal equipment. You do have to have some specialist training and equipment if you want to go all the way down. Um, and bearing in mind, we're talking about 1940s diving equipment so you know there would be it would be a more complicated issue to to work with plus scapa flow is incredibly cold 
I'm not saying the seawater in Pearl Harbor is particularly warm, but there's you know degrees of, of things. Plus, as compared to West Virginia, Royal Oak had rolled over and sunk. She'd capsized, which meant there would be a lot more internal damage from things breaking free and so forth. And obviously the upper works, etc., would have been crushed on landing on the seabed. So Royal Oak is perhaps more similar to Oklahoma, which also, and Utah for that matter, which rolled over and sank at their births at Pearl Harbor. And notable is that neither Utah or Oklahoma were ever returned to service. Utah, of course, was moved slightly and left in place. Oklahoma was eventually hauled out and salvaged, but never never seriously contemplated returning to service. And with Oklahoma, you had the fact that when she rolled over, she was still partially out of the water. She was right next to a nice big flat expanse of Ford Island, which meant they could introduce some rather interesting salvage methods to haul her over and partially upright. Whereas Royal Oak is a bit further out into the Anchorage of Scapa Flow and the nearest bit of land is definitely not flat. It's very, very hilly immediately and doesn't have anything like the infrastructure levels that Ford Island did. Plus, of course, as I said, Royal Oak is, is deeper down and not parallel with the land, which all of which would massively complicate any attempt to haul her out. It's just it's not going to happen. And the Royal Navy already had experience of what it was like to salvage a large ship, or multiple large ships, in fact, from Scapa Flow, because, of course, various private entities had been salvaging the bulk of the high seas fleet from Scapa Flow over the interwar period. So they knew what kind of expense was involved, they knew how long it was likely to take, and they knew from some of the ships that had rolled over when they sank roughly what kind of shape the wreck was going to be in. And putting that all together, they realized it would cost a huge amount of money. And by the time they'd fished the wreck up, taken it south, put it into dock, and refitted it, even by the most pessimistic estimates of things, the war would be long over. And, you know, they're probably right. And even if they were, you know, really, really fast about it, you'd still only have what ultimately is a Revenge-class battleship, okay, the most modernised of Revenge-class battleships, but still entering service in, you know, maybe late 43, early 44, if you were incredibly fast about it. And is it worth occupying a major dockyard space for a relatively limited return on investment when you could be using that dockyard space to either, depending on how you use it, either construct a much more powerful warship like Vanguard or Implacable for that matter. And yes, I know both of those are actually built on slipways, but you can build major ships and graving docks as well. And of course, if you have the ship in a graving dock or a dry dock, then you have the problem of you now can't use that to repair and refit ships that are actively in service and could be turned around much faster. So it just wasn't worth it. Emily asks, what do you think are the most ridiculous weapons used for boarding actions throughout the period the channel covers, both in the completely impractical and stupid and stupid but actually works categories? Well, in terms of the, yeah, completely impractical and stupid, the knock volley gun definitely has to be up there. And, and yes, that is exactly what it looks like. It's essentially a seven barrel flintlock musket. In theory, it's a brilliant idea because it gives obviously in a period where you have one shot weapons that you then have to spend extensive time reloading. It gives you the ability to fire seven shots into a densely packed group of men, like a bunch of people who are trying to board you or who you are trying to board in one go, a rather devastating blast that will, you know, give you a significant advantage. The fundamental problem with it is it's seven barrels worth of recoil all at the same time, which tended to, you know, do things like break the arm or shoulder of the person firing it. And I don't know about you, but if you've just blown away half of a group of people's mates and you now have an extremely painful broken shoulder and you can't use your arm anymore, 
you probably do not have a very long life expectancy, especially considering there is absolutely zero chance of you reloading this blasted thing in a boarding action. Maybe if it had been mounted as some kind of small swivel gun in a fighting top, you know, that might have been a little bit more of a practical application, because at that point you, know, you could use it to clear an entire enemy fighting top in one blast, and then you've got time to reload it, presumably while other people in the fighting top keep you safe from people in the other two fighting tops of the enemy ship you're, you're in combat with who might be trying to take you out. And in terms of the on-paper stupid but actually works category, I would say the grenade. Because, well, think about a typical boarding action. Even the deck up, upper deck of a first-rate ship of the line, let alone a smaller ship like a third-rate or a frigate, is not the world's largest environment. And you're in an environment made of wood, tar, rope, lots of flammable things. And there's, once you're actually boarding or being boarded, there's actually not a huge amount of cover except you know, maybe the guns, which typically will only come up to knee height or waist height, depending on the size of them. So in that environment, throwing explosives that throw out a bunch of metal shrapnel would seem like a thoroughly dumb idea because you're just as likely to injure your own men as anybody else. However, it turns out that grenades actually worked fairly well, um, which is especially remarkable considering it's not the kind of modern pull, pin, and throw. It's you have to cut the fuse to length, estimate how long you want the fuse to burn, then you have to find some way of lighting the thing, and then you have to you know get rid of it fairly quickly. But the reason grenades tended to be fairly useful is because the explosive power and radius of effect of them didn't tend to be quite as much as a modern grenade would. And that meant that as a, not necessarily a boarding, but a pre-boarding weapon, they were quite effective, both from the perspective of a boarding party about to go across and from people in fighting tops lobbing them down onto an enemy deck. And once you are actually engaged in a boarding action, obviously you're in a close melee, you don't necessarily want to be throwing grenades at that point, but somebody who was perhaps in the second line of a boarding action, i.e. not involved in the up-close and personal frontline fighting, if you identified a knot of uh, enemy sailors or marines gathering, you know, 20 paces behind the front line ready to charge, then a grenade could be used to clear them if you were good. Obviously, you, again, you have to cut the fuse properly, otherwise someone might pick it back, pick it up and throw it back at you. And you could also use them if the if the crew continued resistance, if you were successful in your boarding action. But if the enemy crew was trying to continue resistance and come up from below, then obviously you could chuck a grenade down into the upper gun deck and see what happened, because then then you are throwing a grenade into an enclosed environment where most where your people aren't. But yeah, on the face of it, the use of grenades in a boarding action is a bit like you know trying to use grenades in close quarters battle in an open open air environment. It, it seems a bit dumb, but it kind of worked if you were careful. Texas and La Choc asks, what is the etiquette concerning the use of the term skipper? In most naval contexts, and there are a few minor exceptions, but generally speaking, at least in the English speaking world, it will fall into one of two categories. If somebody has been put in charge of one of the ship's boats, they are the skipper of the boat, regardless of rank. And in uh, actually aboard a, a major ship, the skipper is technically, at least for the most of the period the channel covers, is the captain. So they are synonymous. However, captain is the formal rank and the respectful rank. Skipper is, in that case, an informal term and not something you can just blithely use. Uh, the, the general culture that seems to have grown up about it is that Skipper is a term of reference which the crew may use for a captain if there is mutual respect and like between captain and crew. So it's kind of a term of affection, but 
the captain also has to be okay with it. So, you know, if you don't particularly get on with the captain, you're not going to call him skipper. But also, if the captain doesn't like that term, because he might see it as too casual, too informal, etc., then even if you like him, you'd still call him captain. But if the captain is okay with the term and everyone respects him, then you might be able to call him skipper, at least in general settings. Obviously, in a completely formal setting, you would still refer to him as captain. So it, it can be a little bit of a minefield to negotiate, but generally, as with a lot of situations of that nature, it's probably a good idea to keep an eye on what everyone else is around you is doing and vaguely imitate them. Although, of course, as an external individual, even if you see the crew addressing the captain as skipper, I would generally advise against doing so yourself if if you're external to that ship. So, for example, um, if I was aboard a serving warship, which I have been a few times, and I saw the ship's captain coming along and one of the crew addressed him as skipper, I, as not part of the crew, would not dream of similarly addressing him. I would still refer to him as captain. And I suspect that even if one is in naval service, so one's a serving officer or enlisted man, if you're on another ship, you would still refer to that ship's captain as the captain, even if the crew of that ship is comfortable referring to him as skipper. Uh, Blackburn, who, for similar reasons of saving my voice, I'm going to abbreviate this time. Don't worry, your full names will be back next time. Asks, what websites or books other than or other resources would be good for finding blueprints of British World War II warships? Well, it depends what you mean by blueprints, because, I mean, obviously there is the, the correct term, i.e. full deck plans, but... I have seen blueprints used to refer to basically a, a detailed drawing of a ship as opposed to a photo or whatever. So if you want detailed blueprints, you know, deck by deck, side view, cross section, etc., etc., then the book that you can see on screen at the moment, British Warships of the Second World War, as detailed from their original builder's plans, that's a good place to start. As the name suggests, it contains quite a few different warships, but there are a bunch of books in that series. Um, so just looking at uh, to the, my right on my shelf, I've got Battleship Warspite, Cruiser Birmingham, Aircraft Carrier Victorious, Destroyer Cossack, uh, Armoured Cruiser Cressy is World War One, and Battle Cruiser Repulse. And I think we've got a couple of others, but they're out on loan. John Roberts is the prim primary author, but other authors have written in the series. And the specific books are about as thick as the British Warships one, which means they go into a lot more detail for that particular vessel. And they're actually really, really handy for working out precise details about things. So, for example, if you want to work out exactly how large and where War Spite's boilers were in her refit compared to how much space and etc. and layout of them when she was in her World War I state, the Battleship Warspite one actually shows you because it shows the World War I blueprints and the modified blueprints for World War II down to the level where you can actually identify frame by frame, okay, this is where the new machinery space begins and ends compared to the old machinery space and therefore work things out if you if you want to do that. And obviously a lot of it is labeled, there's descrip text descriptions, etc. So I would say that's probably... A good starting point although of course you are limited at that point to however many books have been published to see what ships are covered uh, so for example the cruise of birmingham will cover the town class but it won't be accurate for belfast for instance because belfast was built to a slightly different spec obviously it'll be accurate for birmingham but even birmingham she doesn't have the knuckle bow that the rest of the town class do so you know, there will be small differences even within the various ships within a given class. And, you know, as we were discussing in the first half of uh, this particular dry dock, War Spite's blueprints will not inform you particularly much of the layout of the exact layout of QE and Valiant or Barham and Malaya in the Second World War. If you just want 3D orthographics, then 
books by Norman Friedman or R.A. Burt will give you that in a, a fair amount of detail. If you don't mind low res, you can look at the um, Royal Maritime Museum at Greenwich website because they have access to huge amounts of them and they have them available if you want to pay a ridiculous amount of money for full-scale prints. But if you don't mind a relatively low res glimpse, then there's quite a lot of them available there. And the other place actually is archive.org. Um, they have a lot of, well, in the US term, they would be called booklets of plans. In British terms, they'd be called general arrangements. And so if you have a particular ship or class that you want to look at, then you can put the ship name or the class name, general arrangement, and something will probably come up. I mean, obviously it's not fully comprehensive, but it's a very good central resource and everything is in lovely high res. So, uh, for example, if you want to see what the carrier Ark Royal was like, there's a 1939 Camel Laird booklet, uh, general arrangement booklet, which gives you full deck plan so i'm just going through it now actually because i've got i've downloaded it as a pdf so you've got a uh, side view with obviously compartmentalization plans shows where the machinery is etc and then it moves on to a top down layer by layer starting up with the mast going down through the superstructure then going down deck by deck all the way down to the hold then you've got cross sections through the ship you know starting in the middle and going fore and aft um, and then you've also got the line drawings for the hydrodynamic calculations if you want to do that as well. Anton Alert asks, how difficult was it for the US to carry out the refit of Richelieu? Knowing how difficult it was for US yards to work on British ships, even with plans, how hard was it for Richelieu's case when the original blueprints were probably all still in France, not to mention having to repair missing guns and provide all new ammunition? And also, how did the French government in exile fund such a project? Funding-wise, as far as I'm aware, the French, for the Free French government basically ran it pretty much the way that most of the ship repairs were run, uh, kind of essentially a lend-lease, i.e. we'll do it now and we'll send you the bill later. In, obviously, the Free French case would be, we'll send you the bill once you've got your country back and they actually have access to funding again. Uh, now, as far as refitting Richelieu, it was simultaneously relatively easy and in some spots relatively difficult. It gives you... The, the overall rating was that it, as far as the US was concerned at least, it probably took far more effort than it was worth uh, because they flat out refused to do a similar, similar job later on uh, because bear in mind they, they had Jean Barr in hand by this stage and the US government was like, yeah, we're, we're not completing Jean Bar for you as well. So some of the stuff, like repairing the torpedo damage, was fairly simple. You know, there were elements of the ship's plans that survived, and you could, you know, take dimensions off of the ship in harbour. So stripping out a bunch of concrete, cutting out a bunch of steel, and putting straightened steel back in place, you know, uh, redoing the anti-fouling coating, plating up some areas of rust, that kind of stuff was pretty easy. And in areas where it would have been very difficult, so for example, French produced gyro compass, French produced 37 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, that kind of stuff, it was just a case of, you know, stuff it, we're just taking it off and we're replacing it with our stuff. So you know, a gyro compass is a gyro compass is a gyro compass, so in goes an American-built one, on go 20mm and 40mm guns. That's something that's very easy to do, rather than the, the complication of trying to make the French systems work. And you know, similarly with uh, of the fire control system inputs in terms of range finders and stuff, if something was broken, just take it off, put an American version in instead. With the guns, there was no chance that Amer the US was going to be able to manufacture French specification 15-inch guns anytime soon. But, as I said, they had Jean Bar in hand by this point, so they just said, OK, well, we're going to take some of the working guns out of Jean Bar, ship them across, and drop them in where the broken guns for Richelieu are. And that got it all back into service relatively quickly. Where where you had the more complicated things were, as you mentioned, things like shells, because 
they needed the shells to be fired. Now, for the secondary battery, that wasn't too difficult. A very slight modification to US 6-inch shells could be done, uh, although that did cost, you know, proportionally a fair bit of time and money because you have to take 6-inch shells that are coming out of general mass production and make modifications to, okay, several hundred, possibly a few thousand shells, but still, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively small number. The 15-inch shells, however, had to be manufactured from new. Now, theoretically, that's not a huge issue in and of itself, because obviously when the super heavy uh, Mark 8 16 inch shell came into into play they had to start a production line up for that they were still having to produce 14 inch shells in varying dimensions for the older ships Arkansas still needed 12 inch shells etc etc so opening a shell production line per se wasn't particularly difficult but it was a fairly big startup cost and unlike something like you know 14 inch shell production which had lots of ships and were going to be in service with the US for many years it was a relatively short one and done we're here we've built we've built a bunch of shells for you that's it which obviously then means that the cost isn't spread out over time so the proportional cost per shell was quite high and that was a, a bit of a sticking point so it was essentially a case of no individual task was massively difficult per se as an engineering challenge but a lot of the tasks were very cost inefficient to fulfill and that meant that you know the cost the overall cost of the refit was very high and the time spent was a little bit longer because unlike uh, a US ship or even a British ship where you could basically go oh, okay we just need this component and either take it out of a warehouse or worst case have it shipped across the Atlantic where there would be a warehouse with that in it with the Richelieu, a lot of the time it was, okay, we need this. Oh, right. Okay. Well, we're either going to have to fabricate this from scratch or we're going to have to just take it off and work out what can we put instead. And then we have to go and find that uh, because, you know, say you're doing the, the light anti-aircraft armament, you take it off. Okay. Well, this is this, what this 37 millimeter installation is has it got the size and space and weight supporting capability to be replaced with a quad bofors or do we need to replace it with a twin bofors or do we have to replace it with an orlican and you know if we're putting light anti-aircraft out well this deck space looks like it might be fine but is it fine you know when, when they took her out for trials they discovered that firing the main battery actually destroyed a couple of the 20 millimeter installations they'd put on the ship so they had to then put blast shields up so you know there's a lot of trial and error involved. HNOMS Schleswig Jagubieri asks, why did the US give its older fleet tugs AT, hull classification, a different classification, ATO, in 1944? Was this ever done to other types of ship? In the time period the channel covers, I'm not aware of... Um, this kind of massive reclassification into different hull designations going on, as I say, at least for major warships. Amongst auxiliaries, I vaguely recall that some aux auxiliary classes outside of tugs did ha also have fairly major reclassifications, but well, you know, we'll leave that to one side. I think th the reason for it was essentially the US was trying to rationalize its tug fleet because by that point, bear in mind, you know, you've got the US Navy is effectively operating most of its ships on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. And with most of the hull classification systems that the US was using, it's relatively easy to tell which ships are older and therefore perhaps less useful and which ships are newer and perhaps therefore more useful. So, you know, if you want the latest and greatest in heavy cruisers, you can look down your list and you know, look down CA, 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 and the Baltimore class, the latest and greatest at that point, are going to be high numbers, and, you know, Pens poor old Pensacola and Salt Lake City are going to be relatively low numbers. And the same thing works with cruisers, the same thing works with battleships. You know, if, if your battleship is in the 60s, or the high 50s, then you're like, ah, well, this is clearly a new one. 
um, if you wind it back a bit and it's maybe in the in the 20s or low 30s then you know it's a somewhat less capable vessel but with the tugs you had some really old tugs and you also had some newer tugs and you had some converted tugs but their hull numbers were a little bit all over the place and so they seem to have split them up and instead of just having a t for tug but also the a designates that this is an auxiliary vessel you then end up with ATR, which is a rescue tug, uh, ATA, which is an auxiliary tug, which sounds a little bit redundant because it means auxiliary tug auxiliary, but you get the idea. Uh, and then you have ATF, which is your fleet tugs, for the, uh, your ocean-going vessels. And then you have your ATO, which is your ocean-going tugs, but older ones. And when you actually look at the capabilities and displacement of ATF coded vessels versus ATO you can kind of see why they're making this distinction because the ATO vessels are all either ships from you know just after World War One or they are conversions from minesweepers and their displacement averages around 600 tons give or take a couple of hundred tons either way so whilst they are technically fleet ocean going tugs they are smaller they're less seaworthy they're less capable perhaps more likely to break down and then you look at the atf tugs the yeah not belonging to the atf bureau but the you know auxiliary tug fleet um and those things are on average over twice the displacement of an ato tug and therefore they're going to be far more capable. They're generally armed, um, <laughs> much more powerful. And then you look at the hull numbers, which because the number themselves is retained. And you can see why you want this designation to avoid confusion. Because as we said, with the other ships, you just look at the hull number and it's like, okay, well, that's if it's higher, it's newer, therefore it's better. But you have, for example, um, ATO-166 or... Um, ATO-133, which uh, ATO-133, the cormorant, was a converted minesweeper. So you might think, oh, that's a, a fairly capable vessel. And OK, yeah, it is actually a fairly large vessel for an ATO, but it's not as capable as an ATF. And you can look at, for example, ATO-137, the USS Owl. OK, so 137, fairly high up the numbers. Sounds great, but it's a... 840 ton tug only capable of 14 knots and it's been around as a hull since pretty much the first world war whereas atf 82 the uss carib much lower down the scale number wise so you might think it's therefore inferior to the owl but it is in fact 1650 tons it's bigger than some destroyers and couple of knots faster with a considerably more powerful set of uh, diesel engines. So at that point, having the ATF designation means that if you are looking for, you know, I need some fleet tugs to come out to Ulithi to help shove things around and make sure people don't crash into coral atolls, you'll look and go, ah, ATF, right, I want that rather than a higher numbered but less capable ATO. hope that makes sense. The Freaker 86 asks, In the movie Greyhound, the crew of the protagonist Fletcher-class destroyer is running low on fuel and have expended almost all their depth charges, thus leaving them at the end with only one incomplete depth charge pattern. It's not clear how many they've actually used, but I think it was mentioned around 32, which doesn't seem a whole lot, but is actually in accordance with their listed capacity. That made me wonder if there were few that few depth charges carried, didn't they load up on some extras? And if not, were there some ships in the convoy assigned to do underway replenishment for convoy escorts in 1942 or later on? Was that even a thing back then, both for ammunition and fuel oil? Underway replenishment of fuel and ammunition was a thing in 1942. Not so much for convoy escorts, though. Uh, it was generally held that you, since you're only going to be at sea for a couple of weeks, you weren't going to need it. As far as the number of depth charges carried, 
that varied quite considerably during the war and for a variety of reasons. Yes, everyone had a listed depth charge capacity. You know, how many you're supposed to have on your rails, how many you're supposed to have on your K-guns and your Y-guns. And initially, outfits of depth charges tended to stick fairly closely to that, in part because there weren't that many depth charges to go around, and certainly by the mid part of the war, there were also a lot of escorts coming online. So even though depth charge production was ramping up quite significantly, so were escorts and so were the number of depth charges being used. So if your ship had a listed capacity of, say, if you're a Corvette, say 50 or 100 depth charges, that was as many as you would get because you know the warehouse might have a thousand, but it's got another nine Corvettes coming in, which are going to need loading up. So 1942, US has just entered the war, production of escorts is really ramping up, and there's a lot of ships that need depth charges. It's entirely believable that ships would be, some ships at least, would be carrying roughly what their rated complement of depth charges is, rather than a lot extra. But during the Battle of the Atlantic, where they could, ships definitely would carry a lot more depth charges than they were officially listed for. So when I was on HMCS Sackville uh, last year, year before, uh, year before I think, it was mentioned by the crew that they have, roughly speaking, as many depth charge replicas on the ship as they had, as is officially listed as the complement for a flower class Corvette. However, they know from photographs and from records that when she was in operational service, Sackville carried a lot more depth charges than that. So they're looking to get more depth charge replicas so that they can more accurately depict her as she was in the Second World War. Now, when it comes to Fletcher-class destroyers, fleet destroyers like uh, Greyhound, or, well, technically it's USS, Ke USS Keeling, her call sign is Greyhound, but never, whatever, um, you do have some additional problems, and that's why I chose this particular screenshot from the film, because, as you can see, this is a look aft, and you'll notice that the aft section of the ship has a rather a lot of guns on it. And you can see the depth charge rails there at the back. The presence of the guns makes things a lot more complicated for the depth charges, because apart from anything else, you've got the potential of the shockwave of the guns firing potentially damaging the depth charges. Very unlikely to set them off, but you know could make things a bit inoperable. And also, because they're just occupying space, there is less space aft on a destroyer, or a fleet destroyer that is, to stack a bunch of depth charges. Whereas on a Corvette, which generally doesn't have an aft gun beyond perhaps a, a single pom-pom or something, there's a lot more space proportionally to safely store depth charges. And the same thing for a frigate or a destroyer escort. I mean, okay, yeah, destroyer escorts do sometimes have aft facing guns as well, but if you look at the, you know, from aft superstructure backwards on a fleet destroyer and work out the proportional deck space taken up by armament versus uh, gun armament versus the proportional deck space taken up by gun armament on a destroyer escort frigate or a corvette, you suddenly find you actually, although the Fletcher will be a physically larger ship, you actually probably got more square footage to put toward depth charges on the smaller escorts. So a fleet destroyer is going to have less carrying space, period. And you've got the additional factor of, with the best one in the world, these are large containers full of explosive. A fleet destroyer, which is potentially going to be expected to get into quite heavy anti-air combat or potentially even anti-ship combat, is going to be less keen about having large amounts of vulnerable explosives around on in the open than a corvette or a destroyer escort or a frigate, which is probably less likely to encounter that sort of opposition. So factor that in with the issues surrounding 1942, as I mentioned earlier, and it's entirely believable that the uh, ship in question in the film would be carrying something in the region of what they're actually supposed to be carrying in terms of step charges, whereas, you know, fast forward even a year, and you know, much as Fletcher Glass generally don't do convoy escort work, but if they did, uh, Fletcher in late 1943, I would suspect probably would be carrying something like 50 to 100% more depth charges than they were originally designed to. 
October Nid asks, something we've seen more than once in historical accounts is that in non-civil conflicts, i.e. conflicts between different nations as opposed to civil wars, soldiers tend to get quite good at fake fighting for various reasons. Is this something that ever happened in a naval sense, or does the nature of naval warfare just make the apathy towards the enemy manifest in other ways, like pulling sailors out of the water thereafter? There's a whole slew of factors involved, but generally, you know, fake or pretend fighting at sea doesn't tend to be a thing. In part, at least for the classic Age of Sail and beyond, there's a degree of dehumanization of the objective, because a lot of the time, at least again in the period the channel covers, if you are infantry and you are fighting somebody else, another nation, you can usually see that you are fighting other humans, sometimes quite close and personal. And if you don't have, either due to propaganda or previous experience, some extremely deep antipathy towards them already, if you're not particularly convinced of why exactly we should be killing these particular people, you, you tend to resist the notion a little bit. Obviously, there's you know, group pressure, peer pressure, orders, etc. Um, and as I said, propaganda and so forth, which might change that. But when, again, for the majority of the period the channel covers, when you are fighting at sea, the people tend to be a relatively small part, so usually a little bit distant or later on very distant. And what you're mainly seeing and what you're mainly fighting is a ship. And a ship is very easily a rather impersonal object with a lot of guns that are trying to potentially kill you. And it becomes much easier just to think about we are here to destroy or capture the ship. And if something happens to the crew at the same time, that's unfortunate. But once the ship is immobilized, again, outside of propaganda or past experience, people tend to just go, OK, well, the ship's done for. Now we'll look after the, the men aboard even when a very close for action occurs and there's a big boarding action, generally speaking, once one side puts down its arms and surrenders, assuming that they honour the terms of their surrender, the other side almost never goes on some kind of rampaging butchery spree to sort of vent frustration, etc., the way that more often happens in some land battles. So at least in the gun-based era, you have a degree of impersonalization going on. And the other thing is you're going to have a considerably more structure and close observation to most forms of naval fighting. So, you know, if you're on, let's say, a frigate or a ship of the line in a battle like, say, this one is, then you as a gunner are going to have midshipmen, possibly lieutenants, watching you and they're going to have senior lieutenants and the captain watching them and everybody's in fairly close proximity so you're constantly under observation by people who are going to ensure that you do do your duty if you uh, don't whereas in a land battle you can have you know several hundred men and you may only have one or two officers nearby, and in the smoke and the din and the terrain, etc., it's relatively easy to get separated, so you're not under the same level of direct observation. The final thing I would say is that people do sometimes come up with creative ways of not quite really fighting, but doing just enough to preserve honour. So, for example, if a ship is caught out and there is basically zero chance of victory. So let's say you're a sixth-rate frigate, the weather's a bit stormy, and then out of the gloom uh, a 74-gunner hauls up at, you know, 100 yards or something like that, or your ship's very badly damaged uh, and is caught out. Essentially, you're, you're in a scenario where you could make a glorious last stand, but it's almost certainly going to be utterly pointless and just cost a lot of lives, then a lot of the rules of conduct say you can't just give up the ship because it looks like you're rather badly outgunned. You have to fight. 
but that's where you get the concept of like one broadside for honor and then you strike your flag and you do actually have not very frequent but not infrequent cases of situations like that happening where either in, in when the confrontation starts and it's very clear how it's going to end the the person who's you know obviously going to get massacred will fire a single broadside usually not even particularly aimed at the the target because obviously you don't want to necessarily an, unnecessarily antagonize the people who very shortly are going to be in charge of you and as soon as the broadside has been fired they'll haul up their flag because then they can say well look I, I tried to resist I fired my guns but it then became very obvious that you know once we're engaged in combat we stood no chance and therefore an honorable surrender was possible and sometimes you you even have vo vocal exchanges between captains where a ship would come alongside and would essentially you know with slightly more flowery language say look mate um we have an awful lot more guns and bigger guns and possibly even more ships than you do do you want to give up before we start all the shooting and the and you start all the dying and the other captain would say well look you know on my honor i can't just surrender to you because you happen to have rocked up but i shall give one broadside and then haul down my flag and then usually what would happen is the others i'd be like oh okay that that seems fair and they'd split apart slightly to give them a bit of room to play not far enough that the other ship can make a break for it and then the other ship would you know either give a blank broadside or a broadside let's say deliberately off angle and say oh there we get i've done my bit i tried to fight back oh no i'm terribly outnumbered how terrible awful down comes the flag that's probably the most obvious and probably most common example of quote unquote fake fighting at sea that i can think of paul pimblot asks if lion had blown up at the battle of jutland instead of queen mary taking bt with her who would have taken over command of the battle cruiser fleet, and how do you see the battle going from that point? Well, the person next in charge by seniority would be Admiral Pakenham aboard HMS New Zealand. Admiral Brock is in on board Princess Royal at the front, but he's a couple of years junior to Pakenham in terms of overall rank. So, with Pakenham taking over, he's got a fairly good reputation as a gunnery officer. Admittedly, New Zealand is not the world's most accurate of ships in this battle however Pakenham is the admiral not the captain so that's not really his problem the obvious problem he faces now is is that with indefatigable going up and then lion going up instead of queen mary you've got a numerical disadvantage for the british battle cruisers on the other hand you have queen mary which is the fastest firing and most accurate of the british battle cruisers still around so it's likely she'll score some more hits but you are going to have to rather rapidly redistribute fire unless you want Lutzow to have a field day, you know, beating up Princess Royal in a second without any real reply. With Pakenham in charge, it's kind of a 50-50, not because he's worse than BT at tactics. He's, a, I think, a much better naval officer than BT at, with general tactics. But being at the rear of the British battlecruiser line, he's going to face a little bit of an issue in that it's harder for him to see exactly what's going on going on up front. But the reason it's 50-50 is but it, it means he also can see very well what's happening with 5th Battle Squadron coming up behind. So I think with a numerical disadvantage and, you know, 5th Battle Squadron coming up, I have a feeling that Pakenham will probably conclude that the best course of action is to slightly drop off in speed which will allow fifth battle squadron to catch up a little bit faster which then re-establishes a massive superiority in firepower and numbers but also at the end of the day he's got a light cruiser squadron ranging ahead for scouting duties and if the battle cruiser squadron looks like it's falling back in speed not only does that allow it to dress its line and get new zealand a little bit closer into contact with the other ships but it also means that the germans are going to potentially feel a little bit more confident in heading south for help while simultaneously not risking the battle cruisers being the first thing that runs into the high seas fleet so i mean at that point with two battle cruisers lost 
the British aren't going to lose another battle cruiser from the battle cruiser fleet. They will, of course, lose Invincible, but there's nothing that Packenham or BT could do about that because they're on, in the Grand Fleet at that point. So the battle probably plays out very similar to the way that Jutland did historically, with two probable exceptions. Firstly, Pakenham is going to make sure 5th Battle Squadron turns with the rest of the battle cruisers when they head north, so you won't get 5th Battle Squadron being mauled quite as badly as it did. And secondly, Pakenham is far less likely to try and cut in front of the battleships when Jellicoe is deploying and thus obscuring their line of sight. He'll probably well he, he the battle cruiser fleet's place is technically at the head of the line but if you've got the full battle line of the grand fleet deployed instead of running across the face of it i have a feeling pakenham will probably deploy to the rear initially in order to allow the grand fleet to open fire and then either take his ships directly after the high seas fleet when they retreat when they double back which might actually be a better position to be in for that kind of chase because he's further to the west or he might try and take his ships around the back of the grand fleet battle line instead of across their face greg m asks my grandfather joined the u.s navy on december 13th 1917 as an apprentice seaman his discharge reads birmingham san francisco ca chief yeoman july 26th 1920 we know he served on a merchant ship going to France in summer 1918, but nothing more. What might a US Navy chief yeoman have been doing after that trip to France and after the end of World War I? Well, combined with the discharge notice, obviously this is somewhat hypothetical because I don't know who your grandfather's, uh, or what your grandfather's service reference number or what his name was, etc. But based on the discharge almost certainly referring to USS Birmingham, CL2, and obviously the place of discharge being San Francisco, California, in summer 1920. And then looking at the movements of USS Birmingham in World War I, I would hypothesize, and bear in mind, this is complete hypothesis because I'm just working off this information um, without any further references, but I would hypothesize that perhaps when he has joined the US Navy, obviously he's going to be going through a period of training, which would be at the very end of 1917 and beginning of 1918. And then upon completion of his training, I suspect that what's happened is he's then been assigned to USS Birmingham, presumably because they need a few extra hands. However, in 1918, USS Birmingham is doing convoy escort work around the French, British, Portuguese, Spanish coast. She's running basically up and down from the western end of the Mediterranean to the British Isles quite a bit. So I think what probably what's happened is they've gone, right, okay, um, you, you need to go and join USS Birmingham. USS Birmingham's on the other side of the Atlantic. So here's a merchant ship. You're going to take passage on that merchant ship, which is where you will have got that particular reference. And then... He's gone and joined up with Birmingham, presumably continued cruising up and down. And then at the end of the First World War, when convoy escort missions are obviously no longer necessary, Birmingham takes a short trip into the deep Mediterranean to the far end, comes back to the US at the beginning of 1919. And then in the summer 1919, she's reassigned to San Diego, California, to lead some of the destroyer units of the Pacific Fleet. So he's probably aboard Birmingham for pretty much all of that time. And then when he decides he, he's going to leave, that would explain why his discharge is from USS Birmingham and why it's now in California, because that's where the ship would have been based. Obviously, theoretically, the fleet is based at San Diego, but with the ship would have been moving up and down with the destroyers. So if it came time for him to leave the ship and the ship happened to be moored in San Francisco at the time, well, there, there, that's where he would leave. Marlin Stout asks, Years ago, a friend gifted me a copy of Vice Admiral William Rogers' book, Naval Warfare Under Oars. 
The last section of the book covers the Spanish Armada campaign, and one of the conclusions that the author expresses is that the English fleet was unable to defeat the Spanish Armada in part because the fleet wasn't issued with the maximum loads of powder and shot. Rogers describes this as being in part because Queen Elizabeth, or at least the officers in charge of her navy, didn't want to spend the money required to issue that much powder and shot. Are there other sources that mention this theory, and if so, how much weight do they put on this issue? I could see issuing a reduced ammunition load for the early part of the campaign, since they weren't sure that their plan to outmaneuver and outgun the Spanish would actually work, but once they know it's a viable strategy, why wouldn't they give their ships the maximum ammunition load so that they could do the greatest amount of damage to the Spanish? I must admit, that particular spin on the theory is a little bit new to me. There were certainly ammunition shortages in the English fleet. That's really beyond question. There's plenty of letters that are running back and forth from the fleet to shore uh, and back again, basically saying, look, we need more powder, we need more ammunition. But those letters don't seem to suggest that they hadn't been given enough ammunition in the first place. And although a few ships did either run low or run out of ammunition uh, with during the Battle of Graveline or Graveline or whatever the heck, I've never managed to work out exactly how it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, running out of ammo doesn't seem to have been a major problem in that battle. The fleet being low on ammunition during their pursuit of the Spanish up the English East Coast, that is definitely an issue that they raise. But I think it's a combination of multiple factors. Firstly, bearing in mind that the English fleet is not the same as the Royal Navy during the Armada campaign. The Royal Navy, more properly at that point, the Navy Royal, is... A few dozen ships at most. The majority are present, but they are massively outnumbered, three or four to one, by privately owned ships, be they merchant ships that have been hastily armed further than they already were, or various privately owned warships as well, like the Revenge or the Galleon Leicester, etc., etc. And Obviously, those ships, to a certain extent, are going to be stocking themselves with powder and ammunition, because they're privately owned, um, so there's no real reason for them not to be fully stocked when they go out, unless you know they've maybe sailed for Plymouth with the powder and shot that they would normally carry for their regular armament, and then either just before they sail or when they arrive at Plymouth, they've had a bunch of extra guns loaded on board, which could be an issue, but... Broadly speaking, the government obviously would then issue powder and shot to all the ships, but one it is a mixture of you know trying to load up private ships, which the government hasn't had to deal with before. Do they have the stocks for it? They seem to have left Plymouth with a reasonably decent load of, of ammunition, but then you've also got to remember this whole mostly gunnery and repeated broadsides thing is... Not brand new, but relatively new, and certainly new for mass fleet combat. And as a result, you end up with the situation that tends to happen with most wartime situations. People go through ammunition a heck of a lot faster than you predicted, which is why, as the fleet progresses down the co coast of the channel, they're constantly sending messages back going, we need more guns, uh, more ammunition, and more gunpowder. And this is a, you know, resupply from places like Portsmouth does occur, but they're, because the battles are not quite 24-7 running battles, but there's constant conflicts going on, including several major engagements, they're constantly wearing through that ammunition. So at any given point, they're low. But the government is seems to be doing their best to try and resupply them. The, the, the two problems are obviously, one, okay, finances, yes, Elizabeth's ministers were very stingy, but also, you know, you're trying to supply a heavily gunned fleet of almost 200 ships when no one had ever anticipated doing that before. So, you know, you could send out all the shot and ammunition that's, uh, and gunpowder that's available in Portsmouth, and that might not be enough to top everyone up. So, yes, there are shortages, 
But I, I haven't got the impression in my research that this was a deliberate shorting the fleet on ammunition policy by the Elizabethan government at the time. And um, as I said at the beginning, also, I haven't seen really much evidence, if any, that it manifestly affected how the final engagements of the Armada campaign went. They, they, The bigger problem with why the English didn't completely and utterly destroy the Spanish Armada in that final battle was more a combination of, well, they were running out of daylight and some ships were running out of ammunition, but they literally blown through everything they had aboard and the weather was turning and blowing the Spanish away, uh, not as in exploding them, but literally blowing them north and the English fleet had to try and regroup. So... I don't think having extra gunpowder and ammunition really would have changed all that much there. Chief Eyeroll asks, is there a steam and steel period admiral that in your mind resembles Admiral Sir Edward Hawke? Well, because the tactics and strategy of Age of Sail battles and campaigns are so very different from steam and steel, it is a little bit difficult to pick one. But if you were going by attitude, i.e., aggressive almost to the point of monomaniacalism actually to be perfectly honest a fairly terrible staff officer i.e you don't really want him ashore trying to manage larger strategy but an excellent officer in battle to lead ships i really good tactically maybe not so much strategically and given to coming up with plans that are relatively complex but can be executed by his ships, but also require a ridiculous level of aggression and confidence, then I think Admiral Sturdy, Admiral Dovington, Dovington Sturdy, probably fits the bill. So you, you, you obviously see him at the Battle of the Falkland Islands, and he's present at Jutland, but for the time period of World War One, he's seen as a bit too which is funny considering you've got Beatty in, in there, he's seen as a little bit too aggressive, a little bit too inventive, a little bit too clever for his own good. And admittedly, he he genuinely is not the world's best staff officer. Um, you know, he starts the war in London in the Admiralty trying to help run the war, and he's just not very good at it. But put him in charge of some battle cruisers or some battleships and tell him to kill something... He's very good at that. <laughs> and, of course, later on in the war, once Jellicoe has gone ashore and Beatty's in charge of the fleet during a fleet exercise between, uh, well, with the Grand Fleet split in two, with Beatty in charge of one half and Sturdy in charge of the other, Sturdy completely and utterly trounces Beatty. He outmaneuvers him, has him completely dead to rights, and Beatty cancels the entire exercise in a fit of pique because he doesn't like being beaten, even though he knows pretty much from about a third of the way through the exercise that Sturdy is probably going to completely and utterly destroy him. Um, so yeah, if if you had an admiral from the Steam and Steel period who, let's take, say, Hawke's most well-known victory at Kibberon Bay, you know, what Steam and Steel admiral teleported back in time would order a Royal Navy fleet to go full sail into the the rocky shoals outside Kibberon Bay, for which they don't really have many maps on the general basis of follow the French, because if they haven't gone aground, then in theory neither will we. Um, there's very few officers who will do that. BT might try, but BT is almost Sturdy's inverse in that you really, really do not want BT in tactical command at sea, but he's kind of useful as a, in a staff role. So BT would try, but BT would probably actually run the fleet aground because he's a bit useless that way. Whereas Sturdy is one of the few other officers I can see actually just straight up going for it. Now, there are one or two later on, but the thing is, the further on you get, when you the more divorced you get from Age of Sail style tactics. Whereas, you know, weird as it might sound, during World War One, there wasn't a huge difference between late Age of Sail 
battle tactics and fleet battle tactics in 1916. There were some key differences, obviously, with radio communication and destroyers and so forth. But if you look at the changes in tactics in the 100 years or so it took between the late Age of Sail and the Battle of Jutland, and then you compare that to the changes in tactics between World War I and World War II, World War II naval officers are considerably further removed from Age of Sail tactics than World War I officers, even though you've only had a couple of decades more of technological and tactical advancement. Nick Reeb asks, what was the last US Navy ship to capture a vessel for which prize money was paid out? How much would have been paid out and did this go to the crew to be divided as seen fit by the captain or was this placed into a greater pool of funds as I believe was done in the Royal Navy? The last time prize money was paid out officially in the US Navy was actually as a result of the Spanish-American War because during that period Congress found it very difficult to work out how to apply prize law to modern wars, and so they decided to just abolish prize money entirely. However, they abolished prize money at the conclusion of the Spanish-American War, which meant prize money was still paid out for it. There was an auction of captured vessels in 1899, but if you want to go by chronology, the latest payout, I believe, was in 1903, and that was in relation to the Battle of Manila Bay, because there was a little bit of a dispute going on in that there were a very few ships and supplies and so forth that had been captured at the conclusion of the Battle of Manila Bay. Most of the Spanish fleet had been sunk in some way, shape or form. But there was a series of court cases between Admiral Dewey and his officers and men and the rest of the U.S. establishment that went on until it was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1903 in a court case called the Manila Prize Cases. And whilst there was some stuff about uh, the, the supplies and so forth on shore, as far as ships were concerned, the central argument rested around the Don Juan de Astoria, the Isla de Cuba, and the Isla de Luzon, some of which had been sunk, or rather scuttled, but then raised, refitted, and the argument essentially went that the, the US Navy sort of higher-ups and the government wanted to say that technically by prize law because they had sunk they could not be counted as prizes whereas Dewey and the rest of his crew obviously just thought that yes they might have been sunk but they were subsequently raised salvaged refitted and made available for the US Navy to take into service even if they ultimately decided not to which would put them back in the state of ships fit for war which could therefore be considered for prize money and the Supreme Court, if I'm reading the massive amount of legalese um, correctly, essentially decided that since the vessels at the point of presentation were intact, regardless of whether or not they had been temporarily on the bottom, they did count for the purposes of prize money. However, since government funds had been spent to refit them and make them ready for potential use in uh, the US Navy, that the amount that had, it had been spent to make them ready and refit them should be deducted from the prize money awarded for their capture. And so in the end, Dewey and his crew did get a payout. Um, it wasn't put into a general pool because that was something that the Royal Navy would do later on in the 20th century. And so that they got their payout, but it was a little bit less than they'd wanted. But hey, you know, some money is still better than no money. And they were still getting prize money payouts for some other stuff that hadn't been under dispute from the Battle of Manila Bay. But because it took until 1903 for that court case to be decided, technically speaking, those three ships would have been the last ones that prize money was actually paid out for in the US Navy. There was a further ongoing court case about the Infanta Maria Teresa, but that was decided against because that vessel was, well, sunk twice, actually. It went aground and then was lost uh, after having been salvaged. So with no actual vessel to claim the money against, that case was dismissed. Andre de Coult asks, Following up to my question about a year ago on shaft horsepower measuring, 
How do they measure the rotational torque, and how do the torque sensor work for battleship shafts? Well, for a good chunk of the period the channel covers, you just didn't. Um, or, to be more accurate, you could make calculated estimates, but working out exactly what the torque was in reality was a little bit difficult due to limitations of measuring technology. So, for example, if you knew that you were putting a certain amount of horsepower through the shaft at a given RPM, you could divide shaft horsepower by RPM, which would in theory give you torque. But as we covered in that previous question, you know, you're moving through a series of measurements, nominal horsepower, indicated horsepower, etc., before they arrived at shaft horsepower, which means that you know, given how you estimate those relative values and how that interacts with the actual energy going into the propeller shaft itself, you could end up with some rather different calculations as time goes on. However, in the interwar period, there was a device known as a shaft power meter developed. And this exploits the fact that on a hopefully relatively small scale, when you put a huge amount of torque into a steel cylinder, or more accurately, a, a series of steel cylinders that have been bolted together, which is essentially what a propeller shaft is, the torque, the torsion, will cause that cylinder to twist ever so slightly. Um, if it twists considerably, then something either has gone or is about to go horribly wrong. But nonetheless, this twist causes a, an overall deflection. And what they essentially did was to take a strain gauge, which is, for those of you who aren't aware, a strain gauge is, well, as the name suggests, a device by which you measure the amount of strain something is under. But typically, this will take the form of a piece of wire of a very specific makeup. And that makeup can change depending on what exactly you're measuring in terms of very small amounts of strain or very large amounts of strain. But the principle is that if you take a, your in this case, piece of uh, metal wire and you place it and you fix it under a slight bit of tension, you know, just enough tension that there's not enough slack between two points, and then strain is imparted to those two points, then or onto the object that is either connecting those two points or two objects which the strain gauge is connecting, or whatever, however you want to do it, then the movement between those two points will cause the, the wire in, to stretch very slightly. Now, this is why you have to be very particular with the materials you use, because you want it to be plastic deformation if possible, i.e. it will return to normal once the strain goes away. And when that happens, so when the wire gets strained and gets pulled slightly, then as it deforms, that will also change its resistance very slightly because a, a thicker cable and a thinner cable of the same material will have different amounts of overall resistance, different amounts of heat generated, different voltage drops very, very slightly. And therefore, if you have a sensitive enough way of measuring the change in resistance, you can measure the strain. Or alternatively, if you've got an extremely precise way of measuring the distance between the two points, which today, today you can do with something like, say, a laser, you can just look at the amount of deflection and make that and calculate that. Uh, in a, that's another way of calculating strain. But back then, it would have been resistance through a wire. And so, you know, given you're talking about very, very small amounts of movement, very small amounts of extension, very small changes in resistance, this is why it took till the late 20s for this technology to be developed. But then once it, well, strain gauges themselves go back slightly earlier than that. Applying them to marine propellers is the, the thing that happens in the late 20s. And then from that, obviously, that immediately tells you how much torsion is being uh applied to the propeller shaft that your sensor is on. Smelly Kalka asks, uh, what are examples of where one ship of a class significantly outshone all her sisters? Things like Warspite and Samuel B. Roberts, for example. 
Well, it depends if you want to go without Sean famously, as in you know positive qualities, or infamously, in the case of Bukakaze here. Um, but perhaps a relatively famous one, apart, apart from Warspite or Samuel B. Roberts, would be Prince Eugen. So compared to her sister ships, Lutzow ends up being sold off to the Russians and basically does not a lot of anything. Seidlitz gets literally within a handful of percentage points of being complete before being ripped apart and halfway turned into a carrier and also never does anything. Blucher is at sea for a few months and is then blown apart by an obsolete torpedo and an obsolete gun battery. And Hippa, the founding member of the class, admittedly does get up to some shenanigans in the first part of the war, but then is also part of the Battle of Barents Sea, which is one of the things, in fact, the primary thing that convinces Hitler to try and scrap the entire Kriegsmarine surface fleet. And then, due to needing repairs and allied bombers and minefields and so forth, Hippa never really gets back into proper frontline service. Whereas Prince Eugen apart from obviously her famous escapades with Bismarck, also manages to be the one ship greater in displacement than a destroyer that doesn't get horribly damaged by the channel dash, and actually manages to remain on frontline service pretty much for the entirety of the Second World War. She doesn't get X-crafted or tallboyed in Norway. The Russians don't get her in the Baltic. And eventually, of course, famously, she ends up being nuked. And I suppose you could look at some examples. I mean, using small ship classes where there's only two or three ships in a class could be seen as slightly unfair because then all you really need is a disaster to happen to one of them and the other one by default becomes significantly greater in terms of overall feats just because it's around. So you could look at the Lexington class, for example. You know, Lexington and Saratoga, both big, both very competitive, both highly capable carriers in the interwar period. But then the US actually joins the war, Lexington launches a strike or two, then gets blown up at Coral Sea, and that's all she wrote. Whereas Saratoga seems to be able to absorb hit after hit after hit, and had granted to spend a fair bit of time in the dockyard at repairing those hits, but she is a consistent feature when she's not in dry dock of the Second World War all the way through to the end, and then of course also gets nuked. So you know, by dint of being the last survivor, she is significantly more famous than Lexington for the most part. The flip side to that, of course, would be something like HMS Starling, which is one of many of her class that's built, but obviously becomes quite famous above and beyond pretty much any any other vessel of her type by simply being able to hunt down and destroy large amounts of U-boats under Captain Johnny Walker. And for the same reason, USS England, uh, which is not named for the country, it's named for a person with the surname, which theoretically would probably be named for the country, but never mind. And of course, for similar reasons, as a small escort vessel, she gets quite famous for knocking off a bunch of submarines, in her case, Japanese. Randwick78 asks, After her modernisation, Warspite appears to have only retained some of her six-inch casements forward. Doesn't this leave a fairly large blind spot for her secondary armament, or were her 4-inch twin anti-aircraft turrets considered dual purpose? Well, her 4-inch AA guns could engage surface targets, but... The, well, firstly, it's bold of you to assume that somebody would be aft of HMS Warspite. HMS Warspite tends to have a habit of going straight at her targets, but, you know, jokes aside, Whilst, as you can see here, yes, only her battery of 6-inch forward casements were retained, they do actually have a reasonable arc of fire. They can obviously fire past perpendicular, so the blind spot, if you like, for the secondary guns isn't as large as you might think, aside from the fact you could engage at least with the aft twin 4-inch AA. But of course, there are two other rather major elephants in the room, and that is the aft turrets, because in a scenario where Warspite has a surface target, which is presumably what you'd be engaging if you're using the six-inch casements, 
well, if there's a surface target behind Warspite, you have four 15-inch guns in X and Y turrets, which can engage those targets. And as we saw during Operation Neptune, those guns are very, very capable of taking out small targets at close range. And indeed at Narvik, we saw that as well. But the other factor is, of course, that if there was a target that was so important that you absolutely needed to have secondary battery fire from the six inch casements on it, as well as anything else you could bring to bear because of the aft arcs of the six inch casements themselves, you could also just angle the ship slightly to bring their angle of engagement around so that they could actually shoot relatively aft to engage whatever target it was that was coming up behind you. Logan W asks, how aware would the stokers, trimmers and engineers deep in the belly of coal-fired warships be of battle going on outside the ship? Also, what would the action stations of said crew members be if they were off duty? Well, going through various records of stokers and engineers who are actually in battle, generally speaking, unless you happened to have somebody on board who grabbed the ship's public announcement system and started rating everything that was going on, which did happen occasionally, but normally they didn't know a huge amount about what exactly was going on. You know, they'd obviously receive orders to usually go to full speed or similar, bring all the boilers up to full power if they weren't already. But outside of that, the, most of them report just hearing the sort of thump in the ship of the guns firing and maybe feeling a little bit of a tilt if the ship went into a hard turn. That's really all the noticeable effect that a stoker or an engineer would have of the larger occurrences outside, unless, of course, you were hit. And even then, when the ship was hit, if it wasn't relatively close to the machinery spaces, you'd be aware of a crash and a vibration through the ship that was not like the guns firing. But again, that would be about the limit of your experience. There were exceptions in unusual circumstances, hence why the World War One, uh, well, the pre-World War One cruiser Vindictive is shown here from the Zeebrugge raid, because if you watched the video that I did on the Zeebrugge raid, you will have noticed that one of the stokers in that particular engagement was down in the ship's, obviously, uh, boiler rooms when there was a huge crash. And he looked up and he went, and his reaction was essentially, huh, daylight. Don't usually see that when you're an engineer. And went back to doing whatever it was he was doing in the engine room, um, which I found quite amusing. But yes, uh, very occasionally you could have part of your ship peeled up back like a cheap tin can. And then you'd be like, oh, ah, working under the stars, which, to be honest, is only really possible with coal-fired ships, because if you were manning the boilers of an oil-fired ship in World War II and the boiler room got breached in the middle of a battle when you're at high speed, your first and probably last reaction would be, oh dear, uh, before the pressure goes, you know, the positive pressure that the blower is maintaining probably goes sweeping out of there and you're probably incinerated by a massive jet of flame coming out of the boiler. Elaine Quick asks... Can you comment on why 18-pounders were normally considered inferior to larger guns like 24-pounders when the bore diameter is not that much smaller? The range and accuracy increase probably only helps in the calmest seas, and they can basically penetrate all warship hulls. I believe even 12-pounders could go through a couple of feet of planking. The lower total energy might cause bigger splinters, potentially. There's a variety of reasons. For one thing, you've got to bear in mind that an 18-pounder will usually use 5 to 6 pounds of powder for the charge, whereas a 24-pounder will usually use around 8 pounds for the charge, because the general rule of thumb, at least for the Nelsonian era, or late age of sail, is about one-third of shot weight equals your powder charge. Now, the thing is, Whilst on the face of it, you might think, well, you know, let's say five pounds to eight pounds, that's three pounds or, you know, roughly thereabouts doesn't seem to be too much difference. Yeah, in terms of overall weight, maybe not, 
but in terms of actual percentages, that's depending on whether you're doing five, five and a half or six pounds in your 18 pounder, it's around about a 50% increase in amount of gunpowder in a admittedly very slightly longer barrel, but also moving a heavier ball. Again, the weight is not a huge difference in and of itself, four pounds, but that's a third again heavier shot. And you know, very quickly you can work out if you're using 50% more powder to propel a shot that is one third heavier, you are in theory going to be imparting considerably more energy to the 24 pounder shot because there's a lot more potential energy in the gunpowder relative to the weight of shot in terms of proportional increases in both cases, at least relative to each other. So if you have a heavier and higher energy shot, another factor is that that's obviously going to be traveling a little bit faster and it's going to be traveling in more of a straight line, which makes accuracy a lot easier because it's not quite a point and shoot interface except at you know, point blank range. But if you're trying to shoot at say 300, 400 yards, 500 yards or something like that with a 24 pounder, you are much more likely to actually hit your target if your ship is rolling a fair bit, which of course in the edge of sail they would tend to do, than you would with an 18 pounder trying to do the same distance, because with the 18 pounder you're going to have to factor in a little bit more of a ballistic arc. Now granted, of course, the diameter of the uh, the bore is only, you know, for what's about 5.4 inches for the 18 pounder, a little bit more actually, but not quite 5.5, and six inches for a 24 pounder. So you're talking about just over half an inch bore diameter difference and rounded that down a little bit because you have to allow for around about a third or just over a third of an inch for the windage. And that's on either side, obviously. But even that small diameter increase, of course, thanks to, well, in this case, not square cube law because square cube law is area versus volume. Then now we're actually talking uh, linear to cube law because we're going from diameter all the way up to volume. You, the additional volume incurred in that slight increase in caliber. Okay, whilst obviously the weight of the actual shot increases, as is fairly obvious from the name of the guns, you also got to take into account that that is more shrapnel for canister shot, larger or more rounds for grape shot, and higher capacity for things like star shot, bar shot, chain shot, etc. The you know the length of the connecting pit bits, although in case of star shot, the arms can be a bit longer for a 24 pounder. And that all adds up to just being that little bit more effective collectively, all adding up to a reasonably decent advantage. Plus the fact that when you get to the latter part of the age of sail, you are getting into a period where the hulls of ships of the line or the hulls of smaller vessels that are built of particularly tough materials like USS Constitution can at certain angles actually stop 18 pounder shot, especially longer distance 18 pounder shot that's coming in at an angle. The planking in and of itself may or may not, but the framing definitely will. And obviously on the heavier built frigates and the ships of the line, the framing is a lot more closely spaced together. Whereas a 24 pounder shot with that extra energy we mentioned earlier, probably still go through. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, It's always bemused me how history has pretty much now universally accepted the idiot villain version of Beatty, whereas criticism of Halsey is comparatively muted. Might it have something to do with Beatty's criticism of the much-admired Jellico, whereas Halsey's criticism was directed at the somewhat less-admired MacArthur? In my view, Halsey's ability to say, I sailed through a typhoon twice, and was a miracle away from presiding over the Bataan death swim, makes him a noticeably better target for criticism, yet history does not seem to agree. Do you agree with my observation, or do you have a different explanation? I think a small amount of it might be cultural differences. Now, please do bear in mind this is a personal observation based on my research, and other people's experiences may vary. However, in the time period that the channel covers, at least, I've sort of noticed a trend of... <sighs> 
perhaps the, the bar of criticism being a little bit lower in the Royal Navy, in as much as because you've got admirals like Nelson or Cochrane, for that matter, or Cunningham more recently in the annals of the Royal Navy, and they're at least perceived, if not was strictly necessarily being true, to have basically had almost flawless careers, i.e. victory of going on to victory, going on to victory, although, you know, in, in actual fact, every one of those men did experience defeat of some sort or, or, of an, or another at some point. Um, it means that if you don't measure up to that kind of bar, you can immediately be opened up for criticism. So you might, you know, have a really good career, lots of victories to your name, but you, you mess up once and that's the thing you're always going to be remembered for. Whereas in the US Navy, at least, again, to me, it seems that the, you're there prepared to be a little bit more forgiving. You know, not that the US Navy doesn't have naval officers in its history who pretty much ran a, a flawless career path. But when it comes to assessing other admirals and so forth, even if there was a defeat or two, and a, perhaps a relatively major one in their overall history, if they kind of pulled it back, I guess, and later showed that they could lead their ships to a significant victory, they kind of get a little bit more forgiven. But I think that's a relatively small part of it, especially when you're comparing these two officers. I think the main difference between Beatty and Halsey is that, as I've kind of mentioned before when discussing Halsey, Halsey actually was a pretty good carrier dash fleet commander in the early to mid part of world war ii as far as the u.s is concerned in the later part obviously he did make some fairly severe mistakes and as i've said before yeah he probably should have been moved on to other things because he was a commander for a very specific type of war in my opinion however he does have those successes early on under his flag you know he, he shows he can command a U.S. fleet to victory. Conversely, if you wanted to be only mildly harsh on Beatty, you could say the last thing Beatty commanded with any great degree of competence in victory was a gunboat. Because, okay, yeah, admittedly he did fight in the Boxer Rebellion, but that was one, ashore, and two, he either got, a sh he either got himself shot or hit by shrapnel, one or the other, I can't remember exactly which. But after that, obviously he has a series of peacetime commands, but when BT is called upon for wartime duties, uh, well, his record isn't exactly great, is it? I mean, his three major actions, you've got Heligoland Bight in 1914. Now, admittedly, the British do win that one rather convincingly. However, it's mostly Tierwit and Keyes who plan that operation, not BT. It's mostly Tierwit and Keyes who execute the bunk, bunk, most of the operation. And Beatty's involvement essentially consists of showing up with five battle cruisers and Leroy Jenkins in himself at a German formation that consists at most of a handful of light cruisers, which, you know, even Beatty couldn't necessarily screw that one up. Other than that, you've got, well, Dogger Bank, which admittedly, yes, is a British victory, but it could have been so much better if it wasn't for Beatty and Seymour. And then you've got Jutland, which... Again, whilst in my mind definitely a British victory overall, could have been made a decisive British victory if, again, BT and Seymour had got their act together. And then subsequently it turns out BT can't even beat his own admirals in fleet exercises, which kind of tells you everything you need to know. So Halsey is actually a legitimately good admiral who just ends up in a wartime situation in the late war, which is really a little bit past or beyond or maybe adjacent to his particular skill set. Whereas BT doesn't really seem to have had a huge amount of tactical nous, or even if he did, he disguised it incredibly well behind a useless signals officer um, for pretty much the entirety of his command at sea in a fleet. You know, if you want BT to command a fleet, then essentially you just want to point BT in the general direction of the enemy and say, go kill something, 
and hope the enemy can't really shoot back that effectively, and BT will probably bring in at least marginally acceptable results. Halsey, you can actually give a understrength, possibly slightly outnumbered and slightly demoralized force, and say, go kill something, and he'll actually come back with the results. You actually, weirdly enough, whereas with BT, you pretty much have to give him an overwhelming hand against an outnumbered enemy. Halsey, you probably don't want to give an overwhelming hand against an outnumbered enemy because he tends to not necessarily do brilliant things with it compared to the, again, a overall effective result he could have gotten. Grumman Cat asks, given that the CSS Virginia chose to engage the USS Monitor rather than resume pummeling Union blockaders, could the Battle of Hampton Roads be considered both a tactical and strategic defeat for the Confederacy? If indeed Virginia's task was to break the Union blockade, wasting an entire day fighting an opponent that she could not beat prevented her from doing her tactical job at all. Meanwhile, Monitor's job was to protect the blockading ships, not necessarily sink the Virginia. And with her smaller tonnage and size, I don't see how Monitor could have blocked the Virginia if she chose to simply ignore the Union ironclad and proceed after Union wooden warships. So in hindsight, it seems, the decision to engage Monitor was a tactical defeat forced on Virginia by her own crew, especially as she ended up scuttled because of a blockade that she failed to break. It seems history as regards Hampton Roads as a draw, since neither ironclad was sunk, but that wasn't necessarily the goal of either party, was it? I can kind of see where you're coming from, and obviously Hampton Roads as a strategic issue was definitely a defeat for the Confederacy, because, you know, like you said, Virginia fails to break the blockade and ends up going back into port and not really venturing out to anything like the same degree of success, if at all, that she experienced before the arrival of Monitor. Tactically, obviously, you can you know initially see why everyone thought it was a draw. Both sides had pummeled each other quite a lot. Neither side came away fatally damaged. Uh, just a few minor repairs here and there to make. Uh, but as a tactical engagement, you know, it, it is difficult because, yes, in theory, in hindsight especially, Virginia could have just ignored Monitor, sailed off and continued shooting up various Union blockading vessels, and that ultimately, you know, breaking the blockade was her goal. However, there are a few things to consider that perhaps counter that idea. Firstly, of course, is that even if Virginia had done that, the actual blockade runners that the Confederacy would have used would have been wooden vessels. And if Monitor wasn't dealt with, Monitor could have sunk them, which would have you know, obviated the point of sinking all the other ships. And secondly, until the engagement was well underway, it wasn't necessarily entirely clear to either side whether or not they could sink the other. And ultimately, given that the guns of both were relatively ineffective, uh, the Virginia probably had a marginally greater chance of sinking Monitor than the other way around, in, because Virginia had been reconfigured, remember, to act as well as a gun-based vessel, also act as a ramming vessel. Now, granted, her ram had broken off earlier in on the previous day's engagement. However, she was still designed for ramming, and she was a considerably heavier and more massive vessel with somewhat better sea-keeping qualities. So if Monitor, when you look at her hull, the way her armor draft is shaped, had rammed Virginia, it could have caused some issues. If Virginia had managed to successfully ram Monitor, and she did try eventually, then there's a reasonable chance she might have been able to sink or at least significantly impair Monitor. Of course, the fact that both sides were about as agile as elephants in a massive ring of butter kind of meant that <laughs> although they got close to each other, it, neither one became particularly close to successfully inflicting a perpendicular ramming attack on the other, which is what they really would have needed. So yes, whilst Battle of Hampton Roads ultimately was a strategic defeat for the Confederacy, I think given the context of the period and what each side knew about the other on the day, it's probably fair to say that on the day the Battle of Hampton Roads was a tactical draw, 
because at that point in theory either side could have come out again and tried again the next day or the next day etc but if you want to turn it around and say well in hindsight then yeah you probably could say it's a tactical defeat for the confederacy as well but that requires hindsight so a re-evaluation of the battle rather than you know the facts as both sides probably would have seen them at sunset on the day itself Coneled asks, there's a lot of hullabaloo about what the longest range naval gunshot hit actually is, but after the age of sail, what is the shortest range naval gun hit by or on various warships, crew destroyer, cruiser, battleship, etc., excluding hits against non-resisting targets? Well, if you wanted to be really picky, you could, of course, go for something like the Battle of Lyssa, which is technically outside of the age of sail, it's well into the age of ironclads, but they're still fighting pretty much age of sail tactics so there would have been hits all round at near enough point blank range you know within pistol shot but i suspect that's uh, probably not the answer you were looking for especially when you mentioned destroyers cruisers and battleships so essentially first half of the 20th century really now tabulating the long the short sorry the shortest distance hit for each type of vessel and you know where it's receiving the, sh the shortest range hit as well because obviously a battleship maybe have a point blank range hit from something like a torpedo boat or you know uh, a mars boat or something like that so that would take quite a bit of time and would pretty much be a wednesday video in and of itself however some very strong candidates would be USS Laffey versus Hie, which is, you know, that's well within age of sail fighting distances, uh, strafing and shooting up the Japanese battle cruiser. For battleships on opposing warships, HMS Spitfire versus SMS Nassau in World War One. Maybe the main reason I say that is it is it technically a hit in that the eleven inch shells didn't actually physically hit Spitfire, but the gun blast from the barrel did a huge amount of damage, and this was basically purely because the range was so close that the German main guns couldn't actually depress far enough to hit the destroyer. I mean, you know, the gun has been aimed, the gun has been fired, the gun has done considerable damage the shell may or may not have clipped a radio mast or something on the way past. Does that count? I don't know. But it would be hard you'd be hard pressed to get any closer. Well in fact you can't get any closer because at that point, you know, the main guns physically can't aim that low. And for cruisers, you're probably gonna edge towards the first world war, partly because obviously their maximum range of engagement was a bit lower anyway, and partly because with the night spotting and other techniques being very much in their infancy, you are going to get night engagements where the engagement range is absolutely abysmally short. So I'm thinking of perhaps when uh, one of the surviving British cruisers is spotted by Nuremberg in the aftermath of the Battle of Coronel, and Nuremberg's close enough to be playing searchlights over her and, you know, essentially at accept surrender dash pick up boats distance if the ship decides to do so the cruiser makes a lunge for Nuremberg Nuremberg finishes her off at point blank range that's a very good candidate for about as close as you're likely to get fire team joker asks what was the unrotated projectile system the British experimented with in World War II it seems like a good idea the unrotated projectile or UP rocket system was a set of multi-barrel rocket launchers. You can see four of them here on the turrets of HMS Nelson. The idea of them was one of those things that sounds good on paper if you don't think about it too hard, but actually is really bad in practice. The intention was to create an aerial minefield. And yeah, it's about as crazy as it sounds. So you would fire a barrage or multiple barrages of these rockets and each of them would then deploy a little aerial mine, or minelet, I guess, on a parachute with a long line running underneath it. So kind of like a mini barrage balloon, only slightly more explosive, but also sinking with a relative degree of speed. 
The idea was then if an aircraft flew through the aerial minefield, then the aircraft would snag one or more of the lines, which would draw in the little minelet or bomblet, uh, because there's not enough resistance to meaningfully damage the aircraft most of the time, unless it like wraps around a propeller or something. And therefore, you would hopefully destroy the aircraft with the minelet. The single biggest problem it ran into is the same thing that any kind of area filling relatively minimal numbers weapon, including things like the Type 3 Sanshiki shell, tended to run into, which is if they're one and done deals, which they are, because you know, once you fire that rocket, it's going to take you a very, very long time to reload. Airspace is 3D, and it actually tends to be a lot larger than you think. So you could fire all of these launchers, and you'd create a little aerial minefield in a space maybe a thousand feet high if you layered them, because the mines, had each cable attached to the mines was about 400 foot long. And that would be a minefield that's gradually descending. So even if you launched it perfectly into the flight path of the oncoming enemy aircraft, they could just maneuver around it relatively easily. And even if they don't notice it, you've got to get the timing perfectly right, because if you fire too early, the mines will be above the aircraft, as will the cables, and they'll just fly underneath it without noticing. And if you fire too late, or obviously in either case misjudge the altitude, then the minefield will be below the aircraft and they won't have to do anything. So, <laughs> yeah, not, not the world's most brilliant weapon, all things considered. Now, as I've mentioned before, when this particular weapon has come up for discussion, I think they they could have had a slight resurgence at the very end of the war if their utter uselessness in their design role hadn't you know seen them consigned to the dustbin by the end of 1941. And that is that each of these rockets was, at the end of the day, a seven-inch diameter rocket, so a fairly substantial bit of kit. So my contention is that if some lunatic had kept a bunch of them around ready for shipboard mounting and it had gone all the way to the end of World War II, so you know, mid to late 1944, they'd, in theory, replacing the minelet, the cable and the parachutes, etc., etc., with a radar proximity fuse and a pretty hefty amount of explosive and shrapnel could have given you a rather interesting point defense weapon against kamikaze attacks because you know you got five inch and 5.25 inch shells they make a fairly big puff of smoke and flying shrapnel which is dangerous to aircraft a seven inch shell and in fact being a rocket probably carrying even more explosive and shrapnel because length that would be quite the powerful thing. Now, admittedly, obviously, they'd be, as far as any engagement was kind of pretty much one-shot deals, because it would take quite a while to reload them if you even have spare ammo for them. But if you're facing a bunch of kamikazes coming in, or perhaps even one or two, then if you tied these things into a radar-guided tracking and fire control system, which would obviously take into account their flight time, enemy course and speed and flight time, etc. And then you just went, okay, well, enemy aircraft coming in, possible kamikazes, they've managed to get inside the effective engagement in envelope of our heavy AA guns. So we're now down to our 40 mil and 20 mil guns. And there's a possibility that even if we shoot it down, it might still crash into us or nearby us. At that point, you can just go, right, rotate one of these launchers in place, launch half a dozen a dozen rockets and suddenly you've got an instant barrage of massive amounts of shrapnel which will probably disintegrate an incoming kamikaze outside of the re effective range for any of that debris to actually do you any serious harm now obviously even with five six seven eight launchers that limits you to engaging only a given amount of kamikaze aircraft but given the you know, the cost benefit between kamikaze slams into you versus we've used up a non-trivial percentage of our total refitted UP rocket ammunition, it might have been worth a shot. Given the weight of the overall launcher and stuff, it probably would still have been more efficient to just stick more 40 mils on the ship. But uh, 
it could have at least made itself a somewhat effective weapon at that stage. Runon asks, in ships of the Steam and Steel era, how much did crew stations factor into a ship's design or stability calculations? I'm wondering if the mass of the crew concentrating into a few places during combat needed to be factored in. By the era of Steam and Steel, not so much. In earlier eras, such as the Age of Sail, then yes, actually it, it would be a bigger issue because an Age of Sail ship, like say a uh, third rate, might have the high hundreds of crews, which equates to you know high tens of tons, but only displace a couple of thousand tons. So proportionally, if all the crew go to one side during battle stations, that could actually have an effect on stability. Whereas by the time you get to the Age of Steam and Steel, Ships have gone up significantly in displacement as a general rule, uh, at least on a like-for-like -like basis. So, you know, a, a first-rate or third-rate ship of the line, which is now a, been replaced by a pre-dreadnought battleship. Pre-dreadnoughts, you're talking about, you know, mid tens of thousands of tons, so fourteen to 16,000, even starting out with something like HMS Majestic. And then you take into account that crew numbers have actually gone down because you don't need massive numbers of people on the sails, because there aren't any. Granted, some of those are now engineers, but also the overall number of guns has decreased, and actually the gun crews for something like a massive 12-inch gun are not massively larger than that you need for a single 32-pounder. So although HMS Majestic displaces just over 16,000 tons, she has a little bit under 700 crew, which equates to... If you're averaging out human body mass, probably 60 to 70 tons of person, and then factor in that a good chunk of those are going to be below the waterline, contributing to stability down in the engineering the spaces, the magazines, etc. And the bulk of those that are left are either going to be on the center line, manning the main guns, or on the bridge, or relatively evenly distributed port and starboard on the secondary and tertiary batteries. It actually turns out that, you know, the proportional impact of that overall weight wouldn't be anywhere near as large. And that effect is actually already pretty well balanced by where they are. Um, albeit that there are things called inclining experiments to see how stable the ship is and, you know, at what offset load does the ship heal to a certain angle. And in those, one of the practices well into the age of steam and steel was actually just to assemble the entire crew on the uppermost deck and have them run from one side of the ship to the other because the total weight of the crew that high up could actually induce the ship to either list if you all just went to one side or roll with increasing severity if you went from one side to the other in time with resonance. BFW asks, in the theoretical decisive battles of the Dreadnought era, how did the on-paper order of battle of a fleet translate into the actual structure of the fleet once in battle, such as were destroyer flotillas expected to operate as manoeuvre units to a specific battleship division on a much larger scale, for example? And with this, is there a general plan when assembling such a force for one unit to do a specific job for another specific unit, like with land and air force organisations? Theoretically, in peacetime, there were plenty of exercises where a certain ship or formation was supposed to be stuck with another ship or formation. So, you know, a destroyer flotilla assigned to a particular battleship or battle division, for example. And you would sometimes see this in exercises of the period and also, you know, in initially deployed formations. However, what tended to happen in actual fleet structure and which was you know understood in principle and discovered and confirmed in practice when they did exercises was that you can have theoretical assignments of you know certain vessels or squadrons assigned to certain other vessels or squadrons but in practice once a battle starts to develop most of those tend to just collapse because you can't necessarily guarantee what angle of approach your enemy is going to come at you from. You can't guarantee what their formation is, and your formation will be designed to repel, in theory, the most common or most expected attack formation that the enemy might be in. But if they do something different, then obviously you're going to have to adjust. And because of the different angles that an enemy fleet might come in on, or what stage of fleet deployment you might be in, you might find formations 
completely in the wrong place if they stick to their theoretically assigned area. And so they might find themselves needing to redeploy at pretty short notice. I mean, on the macro level, if we look at something like Jutland, then you can see that there was a theoretical sailing order for the Grand Fleet, you know, front to back in line formation, but they sailed to battle in column formation because that was easier to protect and guard. And then when Jellico had a decision to deploy to port or starboard, that would have massively influenced which ships are in fact the lead ships and which ships are the astern ships. Of course, this is why in the Age of Steam and Steel, the Dreadnought era battles, you tend to have the flagship in the middle because then it's not going to be left massively out of place one way or the other. But then if your attack pattern calls for a certain number of destroyer flotillas to be leading the advance, both to sweep for submarines and to actually attack enemy shipping, and you deploy in the other direction, well, now destroyer flotillas have to relocate because you're not necessarily going to have exactly the same number of flotillas forward as aft or down the sides. And equally, you know, if the enemy engages on the starboard side, do you deploy your port side flotillas to the starboard side to strengthen your attack? Or do you pull your starboard flotillas back to the port side to enable a gun duel to take place? And that's all going to depend on not only what stage of the battle you're in, but how you enter that battle. Is it a prolonged skirmish between light units followed by the main clash, or is it the two main lines pretty much almost hit each other as soon as they're spotted? And then, of course, you've got to take into account the losses. So, you know, if half of a battleship division gets crippled or sunk, is it worth keeping a cruiser division attached to them, or is it worth telling them to drop back and get that cruiser division assigned to somewhere else? And again, looking at Jutland, you look at the uh, fleet formation of even the battle cruiser squadron, you know, putting aside leaving 5th Battle Division behind by accident, um, you know, putting that to one side for the minute, the light cruisers that are assigned to the battle cruiser fleet are theoretically supposed to sweep ahead of the battle cruisers, identify enemy scouting forces, potentially engage or at least hold them, and thus bring the battle cruisers into the fight. What actually en ends up happening is after some very initial skirmishing, the two battle cruiser lines end up shooting at each other, and the light cruisers both have to get out the way and scout further south looking for the high seas fleet. And so, although they're still you know, associated with the battle cruisers, their role and position has radically changed compared to what their on paper assignment would have been, at least for the most typical expected kind of battle. So whilst most plans would say, at least initially, well, in this ideal formation, 12th destroyer flotilla will be forward port quarter for the battle line and uh, third cruiser squadron will be starboard center offset for the battle line and fifth battle squadron will be at the rear of the battle line and so on and so forth. That's only an ideal and what most practical plans tend to reflect will be something more along the lines of two dozen destroyers dead ahead of the battle fleet, a dozen aft, two dozen either side, two squadrons of light cruisers far ahead scouting, that kind of thing, at which point, no matter how your fleet ends up having to deploy, in theory, you can just identify what are the nearest units and redeploy those to fill a specific role. And of course, you know, if the battle doesn't develop in the ideal circumstances, you have to adapt all of that anyway. Alex asks, the modern US Navy uses a series of operating manuals to provide the standard for ship operations. These primarily being CSOSS and EOSSS. Were there any precursors to this system in the past, and how did these work? As far as I'm aware, I don't think there were any precursors to this kind of system. I actually ended up digging up the official reports into the introduction of CSOSS and EOSS in the 1980s, and some of the issues were, you know, they were specifically saying the reason they need these systems is because warships were getting more and more complex and the old systems of operating ships and training people on the systems just weren't working because there was far too much information for them to try and pick up from the, the old methods. And so the old methods, for those interested, would be a combination of on-the-job training. You know, you get assigned to a ship and the senior officers of your department or the senior NCOs or even the senior ratings, enlisted, whatever you call them in your specific Navy, 
would take someone to hand and say, okay, well, look, you've been trained in, let's say they're a gun layer, you've been trained in how to fire that obsolete, you know, 30 caliber, six inch gun that came off a late ironclad over down uh, whatever at the naval training facility. But now you're going to be firing a 5.25 inch dual purpose weapon or a 16 inch 50 battleship gun. Some of the principles like shell followed by charge goes in one end, make sure breach is closed, fire gun are the same. However, there are a lot of differences and now we're going to teach you what they are. There would also be a series of operating manuals, some of which would be published by the Navy. Um, so you can find, say, the 5-inch 38 operating manual, radar operating manuals, etc. And there would separately also usually be some kind of operations and instructional manual from the manufacturer themselves. And sometimes multiple of those on either side, because, of course, the Navy manuals would be more interested in teaching people this is how it operates, this is how to do basic maintenance, and that kind of thing, whereas the manufacturer's manuals would be the kind of, you know, this is the exact component nature of the machine down to every single nut and screw, at, and here is how to replace it, here is how to maintain it, if this breaks, this is what will occur, if this isn't working, this is probably why, that kind of thing. And, you know, back when you're talking about an optical fire control system, you can explain to someone how to use an optical fire control system with a relatively simple manual. I mean, to be honest, you can probably get someone halfway decent on a basic optical fire control system, or at least the rangefinder element, just with verbal instruction. But if you incorporate radar into that same rangefinding system, it gets more complex. And once you get to, you know, the 80s, where you're talking about having to deal with computers, multiple radar inputs, etc., etc., from lots of different radars that may mean different things, may see things differently. Suddenly, that's no longer an, e an you know, the old system is no longer an easy way of transferring the relevant data to someone. The other thing is that in more the more modern period, most navies tend to have significantly fewer classes of ship. So obviously since uh, CS, OSS, and EOSS are US Navy, we'll use those as an example. By the 1980s, the Navy the US Navy has one class of fleet carrier, the Nimitzes. They have essentially two major classes of, of surface combatants, the uh, Burks and the Ticonderogas. I'm not sure if by the late 80s there, some of the FFG7s might still have been around, but even if they were, and if even if you allow for one or two others, that's, you know, in terms of the surface combatants as opposed to the carriers, maybe half a dozen of which two or three classes are going to be the predominant. Whereas if you look at the US Navy in, say, World War II, you could have over a dozen classes of just small combatant if you just look at the destroyer escort and destroyer classes, let alone adding in for heavy cruisers, light cruisers, the fact that you're operating almost a dozen different classes of battleship and each of those is going to have a different machinery set up, different sensor set up, and that might vary between ships within a certain class, and that might even vary on specific ships depending on certain times. So, you know, you look at a USS Fletcher as built, as launched, as commissioned into service, and compare her to a late build Fletcher in, say, 1944, and then look at USS Fletcher herself again at the end of World War II in mid-1945, and you'll find that you know, sensors and weaponry and almost everything, bar maybe the machinery plant, are actually going to be fairly different, and that's within the same class of vessel, let alone, you know, is a Sims what is a Sims class destroyer's operating central operating manual is going to be like compared to that of an Iowa class battleship compared to an Essex class carrier compared to the USS Saratoga, and as such, I think you know developing those kinds of operational manuals in the, the World War One World War Two era, whether it be the U.S. Navy, the Royal Navy, or whatever, is probably both not needed and exponentially harder because you would have to be developing dozens upon dozens upon dozens of manuals in wartime you'd have to be redeveloping those manuals every six to eight months 
And ultimately, those systems, whilst incredibly complex for the time, are still relatively simple enough that the old school method of here's a bunch of different manuals and some guys who've already worked on the system for several years to teach you can still transmit you know reasonably accurate and relevant information. Peter Guy asks, in a recent social media post, the US Naval Institute described how USS Brennan, an Everts-class destroyer escort, along with 23 other destroyer escorts, were primarily built in the Rocky Mountains and then transported by rail in sections to be assembled a thousand miles away at Mare Island, California, due to the fact that US shipyards were quite understandably overwhelmed under the circumstances. Coincidentally, you profiled the Everts class a couple of weeks ago in 5 Minute Guide 376, but I didn't see any mention of this unusual fact. Given the source, I assume this was true, and thus it made me think that the only way this would be practical is where topography allows for easy transit, even by rail, i.e. no narrow rail tunnels to negotiate, as would be the case in, say, New England. However, I recall that Germany transported U-boats over land to the Black Sea, and perhaps to Italy, for use in the Mediterranean, often via quite torturous methods like floating barges loaded with truncated pressure hulls under bridges on the Danube. Do you know if any of this is true, and if so, whether any other navy ever utilised this method of assembling warships? Yes, it is true. That is how some of the destroyer escorts were assembled. And yes, the Germans did transport U-boats over land, uh, both to the Black Sea. I've done a special with Bernard from Military History Visualised on that. And also, they did uh, take a few down to the Mediterranean in World War I via Austria-Hungary. Uh, also reflagging them, but that's a, another matter. Now, was this done in other navies? Yes, sort of. It depends a lot on the era, because transporting ships or significant parts of ships overland has huge challenges. I mean, as you mentioned with railways, if you've got a massively oversized bit of ship or submarine to move, you don't want relatively tight turns you don't want tunnels you don't even necessarily want particularly narrow cuttings in some cases and you, you you ideally just want a nice smooth straight open rail track and with the u-boats yeah they had issues with you know even getting under bridges having to cut off parts of the superstructure or just not install them and put them on later on and only being able to move certain sizes of vessel the Russians moved vessels over, quote unquote, over land uh, through a rather complex system of canals at various points. So they were moving, in some cases, whole ships, in some cases, parts of ships or subs on barges, that kind of thing, which allowed them to maneuver vessels from the Arctic coast down to the Baltic. You also had ships that were sometimes built and then essentially moved in ikea kit form style to other shipyards for assembly so the russians for example with those the famous popovs the circular warships they well not all of them but some of them were in were moved from shipyards where their parts were constructed in the north to black sea ports where they could be assembled and that practice of assembling parts either at other shipyards or sometimes at factories and then moving them across land for assembly at a different port is substantially more common i mean at its very basic level that can also just be how ships receive their components if you break it down to a really small level so you've probably seen photos of uh, 16 inch guns on a series of trailers being towed by tractors or, or traction engines through the US because that's how it, you were best able to move a 16-inch gun from the factory that made it to the port that assembled it. But in once you scale up to significant structural portions of a ship or an entire ship, again, time-wise makes a huge difference. So um, Viking ships, ancient Greek triremes and so forth could be be hauled out of the water and moved wholesale to another body of water, which also meant that you could assemble them away from the water and move them to the water when you wanted to. And that was you know, a good bit of strategic mobility and also meant that you were somewhat less vulnerable because obviously whilst it's easier to build a ship at the shoreline and then just launch it straight out into the water, 
if you live in an environment where enemy raiders may show up at any given moment and burn your ships, which was definitely a thing that happened, then being able to build them either on a shoreline on a river further inland or just flat out further inland and then just you know pick them up and take them to the water when you needed them was an advantage, although only one that you would exploit if you had a threat that merited it. But fundamentally, the extra labour and the difficulties in doing so, even if you're in the Age of Sail, mean that in order for it to be done, it tends not to be a standard practice. It tends to have some kind of external factor that dictates the requirement. So, you know, except for Viking or Greek ships, or in some Age of Sail ships, the threat of the enemy raiding the coastline. For the Everts class, the fact that factories physically capable of doing the work we're not in a position where the finalised product would be able to actually make the journey to the relevant location, or it would take forever and a day, possibly, depending on the size of the ship. With the U-boats, it was the fact that Germany was at war with a country that dominated the areas of water that it had direct access to once you got particularly far off the coastline. And so if they wanted to redeploy a naval asset from Germany itself to somewhere like the Black Sea or the Mediterranean, you physically have to make that movement. And likewise, you know, when when the Russians were doing the movements from the Arctic coast to the Baltic, that's in large part because you know, the yards present in that area are not capable, for one reason or another, of meeting demand. And you can't sail round to that area with ships built in other areas of the country. Lord Nelson asks, even at the peak of the Napoleonic Wars, the Royal Navy created many more officers than necessary to command the fleet, to the point that even quite famous officers had trouble finding active employment. How did the Navy justify the expense of keeping so many supernumerary officers on half pay? There are several different reasons all factor together, but all of them are good and complementary ones. Part of it is that the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars are actually a series of separate wars, you know, First, Second, Third Coalition, etc., which are broken up by periods of peace, which means that between that and specific perceived threats, the number of ships that the Royal Navy has in commission any one time over that period can vary dramatically. But you need as many officers as possible to man the ships when the fleet is at full strength. But, you know, Two years down the line, you may only have a third of those ships in commission, but two years down the line still, all of those ships may be back in commission. So there are going to be periods when a lot of officers are going to find themselves on half pay. Another factor is burnout, because remember, ships go on quite long commissions. Um, they Because they can just stay at sea for pretty much as long as the food and water can be topped up with sail power, unlike the First and Second World Wars, there's not essentially enforced peer regular periods in port which are normally unless the enemy is bombing you constantly fairly relaxing and an opportunity to de-stress while you refuel um, even if it's a forward austere port so an age of sail vessel might spend half a year or even a year or more sailing off the french coast for example and whilst it might be detached to port for resupply, it could equally just be resupplied by ships coming out from the UK or from Gibraltar. And obviously that leads to a bit of a build-up of performance stress. Frigates might be off for months hunting around the globe, possibly years. And so when a ship comes back into port, the readiness of the crew, particularly the officers, to head back out again might be at variance with how quickly the ship can be refitted and head back out again, assuming that the Navy has decided to move those officers up in seniority as a reward for what they've managed to accomplish in the first place whilst on that voyage. And of course, in, in those periods, a lot of officers would tend to have private interests as well on ashore, which they might want to attend to after a long commission. And so you need more officers than you have ships to be able to keep those ships out on the front lines. Now, obviously, you theoretically have the rule of threes of, you know, a third of your ships are out there, a third are refitting, and a third are either on their way to or from a refit. In the Age of Sail, because of those extremely extended periods of time at sea, 
yeah, the Navy could have significantly more of its ships at sea as long as it can pay for it than perhaps in the modern era. But then if you have more officers than ships, you've got to keep everyone's skills relatively current, which means you have to create a system of cycling them through. And that has to be mostly based on who's in the queue, unless you have some very powerful patrons. And even if you have patronage, you know, how recently you were at sea and versus how far back in the queue you are might mean that you might not, even with the most powerful patronage, be able to immediately go back out to sea. Plus, of course, you know, if you are a well-connected person who's already commanded a significant ship and perhaps done fairly well-known deeds, then it's not just a case of, well, you can be sent out in anything. You know, someone of that caliber, the social stature, the ranking structure, the, and the general order of things back then would require that you be given an equivalent or better ship. So obviously, depending on what command path you're going down, that might either be a large frigate, a heavy frigate, um, or it might be a ship of the line or you know, a, a fairly big one at that. And that narrows the pool down because, yeah, there might be half a dozen sixth rates and a slightly battered 64 gunner sitting in Portsmouth ready to go. But if your previous command was a 74 gunner or an 80 gunner or a first rate or a 38 gun frigate, then those ships would be seen as a significant step down in the world unless they were assigned to a particularly prestigious mission. So sometimes the particularly prestigious officers might have trouble finding a ship because there just isn't a ship commensurate with their skills and abilities that needs a captain at that point. So essentially to ensure they could keep the maximum number of ships at sea at any given time, the Navy needed significantly larger numbers of officers than were strictly needed to man every single vessel in the fleet. And that's why, in large part, you end up with you know more officers than strictly on paper are required. The other factor which tends to affect the higher echelons a bit more than the lower echelons is the fact that at that stage, unless you did something really, really awful, retirement from service was purely voluntary. So, you know, once you were, say, a captain, if you didn't want to leave the Royal Navy, they couldn't really make you unless, as I said, you I don't know, lost a ship in egregiously bad circumstances or you were found to be a French spy or something like that. And that meant there might be officers who were known to be a bit below the mark, either in terms of their relationships with their crews or their ability to navigate or their courage in battle, but because they hadn't done something that they could specifically be nailed to the wall for and they didn't want to retire because they liked at least the money that came in with half pay, the Navy couldn't make them go away. And so you end up with this you know, small but still relevant pool of people which the Navy would really only ever put on a ship if the French were invading the South Coast and possibly not even then. But they bulk up the numbers, but the Navy has to then obviously find other more competent officers, which they then want to actually have out and about in their vessels. The captain of HMS Macedonian in the War of 1812 being a good example of that. The Navy, after his obviously loss of Macedonian to the US Navy, was never going to put him in charge of another frigate because of the way he'd conducted himself, himself there. So he was essentially always going to be a shore-based officer. He was always going to be on the payroll, but without uh, because he hadn't done something egregious enough to be dismissed from the service, he just stayed on the payroll, even though he would never go to sea in a command role again for over well, several decades at that point. Molly Madison asks, this may be a topic that takes a proper Wednesday video to cover, but will you spend a few minutes talking about the commitment to and eff efficacy of US Navy search and rescue for its carrier pilots and air crew in the Pacific theater? Yeah, that is a subject that will probably need a proper Wednesday video at some point. Some elements of it will be covered when I get around to continuing the US uh, submarine Pacific fleet campaign or whatever order of words that should have been in. Sorry, I'm very tired. 
there's the land-based angle and there's the sea-based angle. So what I mean by that is if a pilot goes down over land, that's a rather different matter to if the pilot goes down over the sea, because typically if the pilot goes down over land, it's going to be hostile land uh, occupied by Japanese forces. And that means there's a whole load of escape and evasion, potentially meeting up with local resistance groups, being passed on to special forces, and then coming to some kind of evacuation point, which may be a PT boat, it may be an aircraft, it may be a submarine, depends on the location, depends on the time. But it involves a huge amount of coordination with on-land specialists, which is its own kind of subfield. And then you have at sea, which is slightly easier, but broadly speaking, can be condensed into three primary areas of recovery operations. Firstly, you have the plane guard vessels. So that usually would be destroyers, occasionally could be a cruiser. Might, if you're in very unusual circumstances, involve a float plane from said cruiser or something like that. But essentially these are ships within the task force which are assigned to look out for and recover pilots that go down near the carrier or near the fleet. Most often this would be either aircraft that failed to launch properly, aircraft that come back damaged, you know, they're flyable enough to get back to the fleet, but they're perhaps too damaged to safely land, or aircraft that fail the landing for some reason and end up going over the side. So that's a, a, the close range element, if you like. At a distance, although you can occasionally send out a destroyer if you're talking about middle distances, but broadly, um, certainly by the mid to and then later part of the war, because uh, these things take time to develop during the Second World War, you will end up with submarines. Now, the advantage of a submarine is, of course, it can hang around off the enemy coast or under the flight path of a certain strike without being seen, and then pop up and check for survivors or use its periscope to see aircraft coming down and rescue them. And of course, this also has the added advantage of a submarine can rescue multiple airmen and then bring them all home. Plus, if there is enemy, any, any enemy shipping in the area, it can take the occasional pot shots if it wants to. The flip side is obviously it's a rather valuable asset with quite a lot of men on board itself, which if it's then lost, reflects a, a rather large mark against. Conversely, using aircraft like Catalinas, which can set down on the water, so seaplanes, float planes, flying boats, they can recover men, but their operations are much more limited by sea conditions. They can obviously carry fewer men, but they are faster. But on the other hand, again, they are more vulnerable to being shot down by, you know, whatever shot down the original combat aircraft, whether that be fighters or anti-aircraft defences and so on and so forth. But they can perhaps drop life rafts, supplies, etc., and radio in the position of a certain group of survivors for something else like a destroyer or a submarine to come and pick them up. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, this system starts off in a very basic form, essentially just plain guards and maybe the occasional initiative by a, a task group or a fleet to use its aircraft for longer distances. But as the war goes on, as you have more and more naval aviators heading out and you have more and more ships, submarines and aircraft available, these other systems start getting trialed. So by the end of the war, whilst obviously there are still a number of naval aviators who are lost at sea, you do end up by 44-45 with a fairly well-integrated system whereby if you find yourself in an aircraft that's badly damaged, shot down and heading towards the ocean or uh, occupied territory and you can either crash land it at sea or parachute out, you have a reasonable chance of potentially being picked up and taken back to the fleet in relatively short order. I say relatively, you're probably still talking weeks or months rather than days, but you know that's a lot, lot better than either dying or being in Japanese captivity, and depending on which part of the Japanese armed forces catch you, dying may be preferable, because it might happen anyway, but at least if you fall out the sky without a parachute, it'll be quick. Camino John asks, for the British Navy in the age of sail, 
1650 to 1850. When signing up to serve aboard a ship, did this entitle your family members to collect your pay if you happened to die in service, or was it up to the individual to send money home if they made it to payday? In addition, would it be common for a sailor signing up to automatically ask that a portion of his pay would be sent to his family directly? And lastly, if pay was being diverted to a family member, and then if the ship was lost at sea with all hands without any witnesses, what sort of cut-off date would be used? The last day it was known to be in existence, or say the day they were due at a given location. It seems to me that attaching pay to the physical person and making them responsible would be the easiest course of action. However, this would also be a great discouragement to the signing up of qualified sailors or tradesmen who happen to be married. It progresses during the time period that you're referring to. So at the very start, basically the sailor gets paid if they're lucky, usually at the end of the voyage or the end of the commission. And that is pretty much all the rights you have. If you die, you don't get paid, um, which is one of the reasons behind. I mean, it's not really a conspiracy theory because there are relatively strong indications that if the English government wasn't at l wasn't you know maliciously encouraging, they were at least complicitly passive in the spread of disease in the ships of the English fleet that had driven off the Spanish Armada when they were hovering around what's now Scotland. Essentially on the grounds that dead men don't get paid. So, you know, given that they owe a fairly large wage bill for these thousands of men who have sailed from essentially the western part of the English south coast all the way around. They fought multiple battles and then journeyed all the way up north. And this has all taken a fair bit of time. That's a lot of money they need to pay out. But the simple fact of the matter is that the people who got paid were the people who showed up at the end of the voyage and saying, hey, I was on that voyage, I need money. And if you don't show up because you're dead, the money doesn't get go out. It doesn't matter if you're married or whatever. In theory, you could apply if you were a spouse to receive the pay. But to be perfectly honest, given the people and their social position who were in charge of giving out the pay and giving the social position of a now widowed regular sailor's wife... Uh, who do you think the courts are going to listen to? Now, that did change. As time went on into the 1700s, you then did start to see men being paid, not on a regular basis, but at least on longer voyages, they would be paid at uh, times that were not the full length of the voyage. So you might get pay after half a year or something like that. But it was still the men themselves that would get paid. That's why, you you know, you see references to ships loaded with what at the time is called specie, or at least that's how I pronounce it, um, S-P-E-C-I-E, -E, um, which is literally just a shipload of cash, whether that be in paper or gold or silver, which is used to as the pay chest for various fleets. And if you caught a ship loaded with that, oh boy, had you made yourself a lot of money. Uh, once the prize money, etc. had been sorted out. But anyway, you're still, you know, although you're getting paid a little bit more regularly, not really in any position to send money home because, of course, wire banking, etc. hasn't been invented. You know, and with that also, ID checks. You know, how does anybody assure know that this person who has rocked up and said, hey, you know, I'm married to this sailor on this ship... How do they know that that is actually the case? How do they know that sailor's still in the Navy? How do they know that ship still exists? How do they know any of this is true? Um, unless it's all been pre-registered. And even if it has been pre-registered, how do they know that the person who was pre-registered on this list is the person who is at the window saying, give me some money? Uh, these days, obviously, we have all sorts of ID systems uh, that would allow this kind of thing. But back then, they didn't. Now, Towards the latter stage of the 1700s, they do sailors do acquire a right to have some of their pay that they're building up while they're at sea deducted and sent home if they have any dependents. But again, the issues of how do you communicate this? How do you transport the cash? How do you ensure it gets to the right people, etc., etc., meant that it's not really all that much used. 
Then at the end of the 1700s, you have the 1797 Navy Act, and this makes things a lot more formal. It says that technically speaking, um, uh, any sailor at sea can say, right, I want a portion, third, a quarter, whatever, of my wages to be paid out to a named dependent or dependents, and that this can be paid monthly. Well, technically every 28 days, but whatever. Um, However, that meant, again, because for ID purposes and collection and distribution, they had to go to specific nominated places that were able to you know, have the money on hand and have the relevant officers on hand to be able to determine if a claim that was being made was valid, at least to the some extent of what was possible at the time. And that made things a little bit more difficult because, you know, if you happen to be, let's say, 30, 40, 50 miles away from the nearest designated collection office. Well, these days, that'd be a mild inconvenience of an hour's drive or so. Back in those days, that potentially could be a journey that could take several days there and back, which you may or may not be able to organise. Of course, as industrialization and new forms of communication proliferated, it gradually became easier and easier. And of course, the maintenance of personal bank accounts started to become more and more common as you advance towards the modern era, which makes access to finance and things like that considerably easier, as well as you know better public transportation and so forth. You know, by the middle of the nineteenth century. One, there were more collection offices, and two, even if the sailor didn't have a, a personal bank account and you had to go to a collection office, if that collection office is, again, 30, 50 miles away, you might now be able to get there and back within a day via a steam train or similar. And if you were lucky in earlier times, then a particularly nice senior officer, admiral or something, might also be able to help you out. Some admirals were known because of course an admiral would usually have a reasonable amount of money to hand and would also have be one of the few to have a personal bank account you know they were known to take representations from their men and say you know let's say an able seaman would say well my wife lives at such and such of house in such and such town and really needs some of my money this would be before distribution systems were in place and would say, you know, sir, I really like for them to get some some of my pay, and the admiral would, could then look at the the purser's book and go, okay, well, you have earned, let's say, two pounds six shillings and eightpence in your time. Okay, well, do you want to send them a pound? And bear in mind, a pound back then was worth a heck of a lot more than it is now. And then he could write to his banker uh, back at home and say, look, I would like you to send somebody to this and this place and ask for this and this lady and give her a pound from my bank account and you know that would be a service that the bank offered and he could multiply that across multiple people and he would just make a note of that and then when the sailors get paid he would just say okay well, right well this is your pay um but i obviously you asked me to send a pound to your dependent so i've deducted a pound from that to pay myself back and that was all fine but it relied on the admiral having the means of the willingness and the generosity to facilitate that as a private measure it wasn't definitely wasn't something you could just guarantee george robert asks your answer about the intrinsic accuracy of battleship guns made me wonder what were the manufacturing tolerances for guns and shells required to have to get that consistent accuracy well quantifying that can be a little bit difficult because of course as the ability to manufacture more and more precisely improved through the late 19th and into the 20th centuries so too could the tolerances be tightened up. But you've also got different systems of measurement being used, metric versus imperial. And you've also got the fact that sometimes the tolerances are absolute and sometimes the tolerances are relative. So what I mean by that is that, for example, if you look at, say, shells and their charges, a typical tolerance would be about a quarter to half a percent weight-wise at the upper end. Um, you, it's usually something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, or maybe 0 0.4 of a percentage. Um, either way. So you could have a slightly heavier, slightly lighter 
shell or charge by that tolerance amount, but not much more. Now, of course, that scales. This is a relative thing. So an imaginary you know, heavyweight shell that weighs, say, 3,000 pounds might be you know, up to seven pounds heavier or lighter than it, strictly speaking, should be. Conversely, at the lower end of things, say a destroyer shell, using the same tolerance percentage, it might only be allowed to be out of weight by a few ounces. But then when it comes to something like, say, bore diameter, or the diameter of the shells and their driving bands, that suddenly gets a lot, lot more precise. And that's this becomes now an absolute number, because if you have it as a relative number, then you could have you know a windage allowance for a battleship shell that would allow the shell to rattle about inside, which would at best lead to horrific inaccuracy, at worst lead to spontaneous detonation in the barrel once the shell is fired. Whereas, obviously, then with a, a, you know, a destroyer, say a three-inch or a four-inch gun, that could lead to a tolerance that's so, so tight, it's almost impossible to actually manufacture any shells that will meet the requirements. And in these cases, because accuracy and reliability is so much in demand, because you know, even the slightest bore squeeze could result in, again, at best, a slightly dodgy flight path, at worst, a shell that explodes in the barrel, sometimes the manufacturing tolerances were as as close to zero as was physically possible. There are references in period manuals, for example, that when a gun has been bored out and the rifling has been put in, you would have a gauge. So if it's a 14-inch gun, you would check that it's 14 inches, 15, 16, whatever, um, depending on the, the caliber of the gun. But there are references that once this has been complete, and bear in mind that you know, if, if the rifling cutting actually is messed up then it's scrapped the whole thing start over a lot of the time but once all of this has been done and you're like okay we're absolutely sure that precision has been met people would actually use emery paper as a very fine abrasive to go in and remove anything as much as a tool marking so just a, you know the, when you've cut metal or something you'll know that with drills or cutters or whatever, there may be very slight wavy patterns or impressions on the metal. Even those had to go. And there were incredibly precise gauges. So if you say you're manufacturing a 14-inch gun barrel, they would have pre-calibrated pre that gauge to exactly 14 inches. And as it goes down, if you're even 0 0.01 of an inch out, that gauge won't fit. And then it's very carefully file that bit down. And that's how you end up with incredibly precise artillery, minus wind, weather, atmospheric conditions, and the fact the ship's bouncing around all over the place. Reva asks, we all know the legends of Beatty's flag officer, but how bad could it get? Do you have any examples of when flag messages were messed up badly enough to cause chaos or even own goals? Well, there's so many examples. I mean, obviously you've got Admiral Tryon's flag signals which resulted in the collision of Camperdown and Victoria with the sinking of the latter. Now, that whole incident is something I'm going to have to cover in a Wednesday video of at some point because there's a whole load of complex reasoning why that flag signal was made and why the circumstances ended up being quite as bad as they did. But ultimately, you know, whatever Tryon may or may not have been trying to accomplish and whatever his intentions may or may not have been for that particular exercise, it ended up with, you know, two battleships colliding and the loss of the flagship of the Mediterranean fleet, which, yeah, that's a bit of an own goal. Sometimes flag messages could be perfectly valid, but could cause chaos or own goals simply by being there at an inappropriate time. So much like a number of BT signals, they could be left up for too long. So the signal might have been the correct action to take at one point, but 10 minutes later, if that flag signal hasn't been pulled down and people haven't executed it, and then it is pulled down and everyone executes it, well, now that may be entirely the wrong situation. Um, you can also end up with confusion, especially early on when flag signals were actually a lot more basic, which you might think makes things easier. But with a very limited repertoire of flags, and very often flag signal 
regimens being set on a per voyage basis by various admirals and perhaps not even necessarily being down in writing you could have a situation where a red flag hoisted at the mainmast for example might mean attack the enemy but a red flag hoisted at the mizzenmast might mean something like the admiral's ship is in distress you know follow the commands of the second in command vessel except that if a ship is you know stern onto you and that couple of thousand yards away and it hoists a red flag how easy is it to determine whether that flag is at the mizzenmast or mainmast or if one or the other mast has been shot away and the flag goes up well did they mean for it to be on their other mast or are they hoisting that on that mast because the other mast is gone who knows um, this was one of the reasons why the more complex system of flag signaling was made so that you could actually specify by use of the flags what you are trying to say rather than have to rely on combinations of particular a particular flag of a particular color of a particular position means this very complex message and of course you have the legendarily bad Kamchatka although to be fair her signals were a combination of flags signal lights and radio although mostly signal lights and flags depending on which particular incident you're referring to all and with that particular one I, I must admit, I'd, I have to mention here some people are out there who try to claim that the issues with Kamchatka were overblown now there is a discussion to be had about you know exactly how bad Kamchatka was and you know which particular incidents uh, occur at which particular severity ratings because there are a few different accounts which offer different views but that's a separate matter but one of the things I do find particularly laughable in some people's attempts to reclaim the competency of Kamchatka is they argue the famous do you see torpedo boats signal which she signaled several times um, they say oh no that that wasn't actually the ship deliberately signaling do you see torpedo boats um, and they, they weren't trying to sabotage or just being generally incompetent they were signaling the correct signal but the signal for do you see torpedo boats was similar to this other signal which made more made more sense and they were actually signaling that and the fault then goes to Kinyat Suvorov or whichever other ship was reading the signal and then relaying it to uh, Rodosvensky and they just misinterpreted it which is all well and good except it fails on the most basic level of critical thinking because I mean yeah okay it's potentially true that a do you see torp torpedo boats or similar signal might be confused for another signal that has a similar pattern however of all the problems that the second pacific squadron had communications between ships were not generally a problem there were obviously specific instances camtrack and being involved in a lot of them but if it was the flagship's signal officers who were bad enough that they were misinterpreting incoming signals, well, that in and of itself means that signaling is still awful in the Russian fleet. You've just slightly moved the location of it. But more specifically, if it's the signaling staff on the flagship that have the problem, they would logically be misinterpreting the vast majority of incoming signals from across the fleet which would actually mean the second pacific squadron would be subject to considerably more confusion and chaos on its way across to the pacific than it was historically which is saying something but in fact when you actually study the whole voyage what you see is that most ships were able to communicate with the flagship and vice versa and they were understanding each other they now whether or not they actually executed the orders that they were given by the flagship or whether the flagship particularly appreciated their replies is a separate matter but they did actually at least understand what each other was saying the fact that Kamchatka herself seems to be pretty much the root cause of the vast majority of miscommunications within the fleet indicates that the problem actually lies with Kamchatka because if Kamchatka is sending out faulty signals that are reading the wrong way and the flagship is interpreting the signals they're being sent 
um, then that explains the situation. Whereas, obviously, as I said, if the flagship's crew are bad at interpreting signals, everybody's signals should have been misinterpreted, but they weren't. You know, sometimes people just need to think one step ahead of whatever it is they want to smash on a keyboard. Matt0612 asks, I just finished reading Commander Gene Flucky's book, Thunder Below, detailing his tenure in command of USS Barb. I thoroughly enjoyed it and was wondering if you had other recommendations for other books by commanding officers in a similar narrative style. I enjoyed learning about his command style and how decisions were made in battle. Also, how common was it for submarine commanders to be as politically adept as Flucky was portrayed in his book? He always seems to have connections up the chain and usually got his way even when that broke standard protocol. I can recommend a number of good books by commanding officers in the Second World War, but I'm afraid if you want a specific narrative style, I'm afraid I'm one of those types who will read almost anything that is interesting in its subject matter, regardless of the narrative style. So unless somebody is catastrophically cartoonishly bad... Uh, like, say, in the 40k universe, the fictional memoirs of Janet Sulla in the Caiaphas Cain series, or has a very obvious, very particular, heavily influenced style, like, say, reading The Silmarillion, I generally don't tend to pick those kinds of net distinctions up. Although I must say, after listening to The Silmarillion in audiobook form for a couple of weeks, I found myself writing in that style for a few more weeks until I kind of fade, it faded from memory, at least the style did. So I'm afraid if you want a particular narrative style, I'm going to have to appeal for people in the comments. Those of you who've read Thunder Below, what other books have you read that have a similar narrative style? Let us all know. Uh, but if you want other books by commanding officers of the Second World War, then drop me a Discord message or an email and I'll do my best to send you a list. No promises about the narrative style, though. Now, as far as politically ad adept commanders, it's not common for commanders of uh, submarines or destroyers or whatever to have big connections further up the chain of command, although patronage, connections, old boys club, favors etc with whatever you want to call it they do exist and have always existed in various navies u.s navy royal navy everybody else's navy but exactly who has those connections and has the ability to manipulate them and has the skill to uh, in terms of the, the combat capability to justify the navy accepting their manipulations that that's an entirely different matter it's not going to be as i say restricted or ratioed to any one particular type of vessel it's almost luck of the draw because in order for them it to work and to work consistently you have to be a of an officer who has those connections in in the first place and they could be because you have relatives in the navy you could have political connections outside the navy you could have made connections yourself through just being a really good officer with a good reputation. And then you actually have to be a competent officer in your current active field of operations, because to a certain degree in peacetime and definitely in wartime, no matter how good a connection you have, if you're constantly getting your ship damaged or sunk and not really accomplishing all that much for it, the Navy is going to relatively quickly reassign you somewhere where you can't do quite so much damage. It doesn't matter how good your connections are. Conversely, if you are really good at sinking enemy ships and generally bringing your own ship home in one piece, then even a mild set of connections will allow you to get almost within reason anything that you want because people want to feed into success and it's much harder to criticize you because, you know, if let's say you get an extra deck gun or an ice cream machine, given that we're talking about the US Navy, when technically speaking, you shouldn't have one. Well, if you're good at what you do, then someone might be willing to stick their neck out higher up the chain of command to ensure that you get your additional supplies, whatever they happen to be, because they can be relatively confident that if 
anyone calls them up on it, they can say, well, look, this ship is already performing 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% above expectations in terms of destruction of our enemies. And hey, now look, it's come back into port after that, and the crew is a lot happier, and they've destroyed 80, 90, 100% more than the average ship of that type has. So, you know, it was a justified investment, at which point, you know, nothing breeds forgiveness better than success. So in this particular case, Flucky is both good and has a connection network to uh, manipulate to further his causes. But that could be anyone. It could be no one. It could vary year by year because, of course, this is an individual circumstance, not a, a general sort of X percentage of submarine commanders will be this well-connected thing. Eric Van Duting asks, I recently read a book called Operation Pedestal by Max Hastings. One thing that struck me was that he had the most negative opinion of ship-based anti-aircraft fire of every, any author I've ever read, even going so far as to say in 1945 US Pacific Fleet anti-aircraft fire was still ineffective. I thought this to be a bit contradictory with the accounts of Axis pilots attacking the pedestal convoy repeatedly dropping their torpedoes too far uh, from the convoy to, after being spooked by anti-aircraft fire. Have you read this book and what is your opinion on this topic? I haven't read his book on Operation Pedestal, but I would quite thoroughly disagree with his conclusions. If I was going to be charitable, I would point out that whilst he has received a decent amount of praise for his work on Vietnam and the Falklands conflicts, both of which he was present for, he has received some criticism for those as well, but you know, there's a reasonable amount of praise going around for at least some of what he wrote about those. Whereas the further back in time he goes for World War One and World War Two, there's more criticisms that that crop up. And so, with that in mind, I would say again, being charitable, that perhaps his idea of what constitutes effective anti-aircraft defence has been coloured somewhat by his experiences in what is still in quite old warfare these days, but comparative to World War II, was very modern warfare. And obviously in something like the Falklands, if you don't shoot down you know, over 50% of the incoming attacks, which would probably make them break off, or just down them all, then there is a reasonable chance that whatever survivors come through are probably going to hit you. So whether that be with bombs or an exocet. So an effective anti-aircraft defense would involve shooting down either all incoming attackers or so many of them that the remaining attackers break off. That's not how things work in World War II. You know, this is the era of, you know, before precision guided weapons for the most part, and definitely before the era of precision guided surface to air defenses for the most part. But that means that well, two things. Firstly, he's not taking into account just how many aircraft actually were shot down. Now, yes, not all aircraft were shot down, but if, for example, you look at the US Navy's estimates for the Second World War, and so this is a report that was written in late 1945. Now, obviously, late 1945, they may not have fully assessed claims, by comparing it to what was left of the Japanese records. So there is that caveat. But at that point, uh, reading from the first paragraph of chapter two, it says that although the burden of ship defense against enemy air attacks fell largely upon her own carrier and land-based aircraft, approximately 7,600 to 7,800 enemy planes came within shipboard anti-aircraft range during the 45 months of the war. Of this, an estimated 2,773 or 36% were shot down by anti-aircraft fire. Now, I don't know about you, but shooting down a, about a third of all incoming enemy aircraft is pretty good performance, because apart from anything, that's one third less enemy aircraft that will be dropping bombs and torpedoes on you. And given that the accuracy statistics for bombs and torpedoes of that period isn't too great, that reduction in number might move the margins from, you're probably going to cop a hit in this attack, to there's a reasonable chance you probably won't get hit. And that's not accounting for aircraft damaged and forced to break off their attack runs, aircraft that are 
distracted from their attack runs and therefore miss rather than hit. And also the breaking up effect of anti-aircraft fire. So, you know, this can be anything from a long range barrage of heavy AA, which makes an attack formation break up to go around it and not get hit. And that means that instead of, let's say, dropping a dozen torpedoes as a uniform block from which there probably is no escape, though even if you don't shoot down any of the aircraft, those same dozen torpedoes might be dropped in a sequence over the space of a few minutes as the pilots try and regain their positions, which then turns it from a no-win scenario to a case of, well, how well can you do torpedo beats 12 times over? And you can kind of see this, for example, in the attack on Force Z. HMS Repulse actually evades far, far, far more torpedoes than she's struck by. And in part, that's because the initial attacks on her are a little bit broken up and patchwork, partially because of her anti-aircraft defenses. They don't really do a huge amount of shooting down of enemy aircraft, but they do enough that the ship survives right up until the Japanese pilots manage to pull off a pincer attack, at which point it becomes the said no-win scenario. But given her rate of torpedo evasion up to that point, you can make a fair argument that had her anti-aircraft defences been just a little bit more effective and just managed to break up one of those incoming arms of the pincer, not even shooting anyone down, just you know breaking up and delaying their attack, she might still have survived. And, you know, like you mentioned, with a pedestal convoy, how many people are spooked by anti-aircraft fire into dropping things too early or to evading or jinking around, which puts off their aim? Because another aspect, and it's not just the long range stuff, it's also at the shorter range. If there's a bunch of tracer fire spewing up from, you know, pom-poms, bofers, orlicans, etc., etc., this is known to have a psychological impact on the human mind. If you can see fire coming up at you, you're more likely to voluntarily or involuntarily try and avoid it than if you can't see it, even if the actual weight of fire that you can't see is significantly more than that which you can. And actually, Forsyth is a good example of that, again, because at that point, Prince of Wales's Bofors didn't have tracers. Her, so Prince of Wales's pom-poms didn't have tracers, One, and she had a Bofors or two which did according to at least some reports, and that led to Japanese attacks concentrating on her stern because the tracer-equipped 40mm had a forward arc of fire around her bows, and that meant that although there was actually considerably more medium anti-aircraft fire at her stern, which would have been more dangerous because you couldn't see it, the Japanese pilots just tended to drift there and avoid the, the one little stream of tracer out front, even though that wasn't actually all that dangerous. It's the psychology of the matter. So similarly, with anti-aircraft fire, we combine the effects of actually you know shooting down aircraft plus the effects of the barrage, long-range barrage fire, plus the effects of the close-range fire with tracers and bits of battle damage and so on and so forth, all of this degrades the enemy's ability to hit you far beyond what you would get with just shooting people down. And that is perhaps something that is more of an effect in World War II when there's huge amounts of fire being thrown around as compared to the modern era where outside of early warning systems, a pilot is very unlikely to see a missile coming in that's going to kill him. And if it does, it's going to be too late for him to do anything about it. You know, there's not a huge number of this, these psychological interactions with more modern warfare. And I think he probably is just missing that. You know, the fact of the matter is that if uh, the enemy send in 40 strike aircraft, for example and your anti-aircraft barrage puts up enough of a defence that those 40 aircraft don't hit you, which might obviously be combined with some evasive manoeuvring, then your anti-aircraft defences have done their job. Now, ideally, you would want to shoot them down because then they can't come back and try again. But at the end of the day, the point of the anti-aircraft defences is to stop you being hit. That's it. You know, if you if you can get to continue your mission, you have succeeded just maybe not quite as much as you might ideally have preferred in terms of doing direct damage to the enemy's air power. And if you neglect that fact, 
then you really have to call into question somebody's claims. Ultimately, you could look at how many aircraft did the Japanese send after US ships in 1942. So, you know, how many aircraft went after Lexington and Yorktown at Coral Sea? How many aircraft actually went after Yorktown at Midway, as opposed to the total combined uh, levels of aircraft present on the Japanese carriers. They're relatively small numbers, and even for Santa Cruz or Eastern Solomon as well. Look at the numbers. They're not very high. You're talking a dozen, two dozen aircraft at most in, mo in most of those cases, and they do a colossal amount of damage. Fast forward to 44-45, and the Japanese are sending hundreds of aircraft, not dozens, hundreds, at the US fleet. Now, admittedly, as the US report says, a lot of those aircraft are being engaged by enemy, by uh, Allied fighters and so forth. But you know, look at the several thousand that actually made it into anti-aircraft gun range, and look at the success rate of that considerably larger number of Japanese aircraft attacking in 44-45 versus the success rate of much smaller numbers of Japanese aircraft attacking in 42. The only difference at that point, once they've got into AA gun range, is the effectiveness of the anti-aircraft barrages. And the fact that the US isn't losing fleet carriers and other ships left, right, and center kind of gives away that, yeah, that, that AA fire is actually doing its job. Dylan Bartlett asks, how effective was the Romanian and Bulgarian navies against the Russians during the Black Sea campaign in World War II? It depends very much how you rate effectiveness, because neither Bulgaria nor Romania had particularly large navies, and therefore, you know, they can't have a dramatically huge impact. Plus, of all the various naval theatres, whilst the Black Sea campaign was fairly viciously fought. It wasn't fought with particularly large numbers of resources on either side compared to the Mediterranean, the North Sea, the Atlantic, or even to a certain extent the Baltic, which of course means if, if it's a fairly small, in quotation marks, conflict fought by relatively small navies, there's not going to be a huge amount of effect one way or the other. And you can pretty much see that in the results, the vast majority of the relatively short kill list that the Bulgarian and Romanian navies accrue tends to be some Russian fast attack craft, a bunch of Russian submarines, and in the case of the Romanian navy, one Russian destroyer. That's really about it. You know, no cruisers, no battleships. Not that there were a huge number of either for the Russians on the in the Black Sea, which is yeah again kind of the problem. And a lot of their successes came through mine warfare. Although, to be fair, the Romanians did have a rather interesting defense of one of their own port areas against a Russian attack group relatively early in the conflict. But it is mostly mines that do the damage, followed up by sub-chasers and sub-hunters, that kind of thing. The flip side is, of course, if you want to look at effectiveness in terms of how many ships of the enemies did you sink, you know, almost regardless of type or displacement, versus how many did you lose, then the Romanian and Bulgarian navies actually come out quite well because they sustained very, very few losses, but did manage to inflict a number on the Russians. So, you know, their, if you like, their kill-death ratio was actually very high. John Plate asks, when I was younger, I had a real interest in World War II jet aircraft. However, I was never, never able to find out good information about the naval aspect. Towards the end of the war, were there carriers who had jet aircraft, and who were the big players in developing naval jet aircraft? There weren't any jet aircraft operational aboard aircraft carriers during World War II. The very first successful landing of a jet aircraft on a carrier was in December 1945, so a few months after World War II was officially over, by a vampire, as you can see here, piloted by Eric Winkle Brown, that was his nickname. And uh, actually, I was very lucky in that I very briefly got, for about five minutes, got to chat to and meet him at the other end of his life, back when I was a university student, when he was being given an honorary degree by the university I was attending. Uh, incredibly accomplished test pilot, by the way. Now, Obviously, that means there are going to be no books on 
jet aircraft aboard carriers in the Second World War. It's all post World War II. And that in turn means that the only people really heavily innovating in terms of naval jet aircraft in the opening years of that era are the British and the Americans, by dint of being the only people left standing with a substantial aircraft carrier fleet and the means to experiment. Obviously, other nations would pick up aircraft carriers relatively quickly, but the size and immediacy of the British and American carrier fleets meant they were the ones who did all the running. Interestingly enough, despite the fact the US fleet had come out considerably larger than the Royal Navy from World War II, it was actually the British that did an awful lot of the early running. So, as I said earlier, they are the first to successfully land a jet aircraft on a carrier, but also when you look at things like the angled flight deck, um, the landing system, the light and mirrors landing system that gets people on uh, the correct approach, all of this and more is British uh, developed technology. They obviously then share it with the Americans who go on to implement it on a far grander scale, but it's the it's the Royal Navy that's doing an awful lot of that inventiveness. Now, as far as books to help understand the jet era on carriers, bearing in mind, obviously, the channel only really goes up to 1950 for the most part, and so you're talking about very early experiments. So you could read Eric Brown's own autobiography, Wings on My Sleeve. Um, there's also Jets at Sea, Naval Aviation in Transition 1945-55 to 55 by Leo Marriott. And there's a handful of others out there, but generally speaking, that period of development tends to be covered by books specifically about either British or American carrier development. So there's a, quite a few good ones on those that you can pick up as well, albeit you do end up obviously having to pick up two books to cover both navies. Gautierga asks, what was the intended role of the Hellmover, or Helmover possibly, super torpedo, and do you suppose it would have actually worked? Well, there's relatively little information available about it, but here's a picture of prototype. And yes, that is a Lancaster. <laughs> it's a little big. The idea appears to have been essentially an airdropped Kai-10, except remote controlled rather than human controlled. So this thing had a warhead of a ton, which meant it's about twice as powerful as any other torpedo available in the Second World War, and three times as powerful as most. And that's when we're talking about surface and sub-launch torpedoes. This thing's airdropped. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's going to blow straight through pretty much anything it hits. The idea, as I said, like a Kai-10, it's, it's almost a semi-submersible. It is actually a torpedo. It does travel underwater, but it's not designed to most of the time because, you know, if you drop it underwater, you you're going to find it difficult to remote control. So the idea seems to have been to use a strategic bomber to take this rather large device to just outside the range of enemy anti-aircraft fire. You then deploy said torpedo into the water where it acts, as I said, as a semi-submersible. So you can see at least an element of it above the water. The aircraft retreats further away and can then fly around and remote control it from there. And the semi-submersible nature is also necessary because the power plant is actually an air-breathing internal combustion engine. Um, some sources indicate a downrated version of the Merlin, which can move the ton of explosive through the water at about 40 knots. And then as it goes on, once you get to uh, attack range, I guess, you order it to submerge, at which point compressed air canisters aboard will continue to feed the engine so that it keeps going forward at which point it also now becomes uncontrollable. So it just goes in a straight line from the point you order it to submerge. Now, of course, that means you could attack the thing on the surface at a longer distance, although it'd be fairly difficult to spot and fairly difficult to hit. And then once you're close enough and you think you've got the line of approach right, it should, in theory, just go like a normal torpedo and hit its target with a very, very big boom. Now, what would you use it for? And... Would it have actually worked? Well, I suspect it probably would have had a reasonable degree of effect. I mean, if the Germans were able to get HS-293s and Fritz Xs at least some of the time to guide in on Allied warships, despite the amount of anti-aircraft firepower and fighters that the Allies could put up, the Allies being able to do this to Axis navies shouldn't be too difficult. 
of course, a ton of explosives delivered while underwater is going to pretty much destroy anything it hits. But in theory, you could also use the thing against shore-based installations, um, it's like keys and dry dock gates or ships moored up in harbours, because instead of having to fly over the teeth of the enemy air defences to drop a bomb straight onto them or fly low through the defences to drop a torpedo at them, you could potentially drop a torpedo in another portion of the harbour that's much less defended, and they were also working on a surface launch version that could have gone even further, and just guide it through and around the enemy defences and up channels and so forth until you get into attack range, and then you obviously drop it underwater for that final approach. It would have been a fairly complex and difficult operation, of course, but then very few things in war when it comes to experimental weapons aren't. The only problem would have been that by the time it was actually in operational service, the number of potential targets would have been fairly small. Brad Bargmayer asks, Recently I've travelled to Greece, Turkey and other countries in the Middle East. Other than the Anzac landing, are there any other interesting or decisive naval battles in the region that contributed to the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire's loss and subsequent British and French mandates for the region? There are a number of interesting naval battles in the First World War, like the Battle of Imbros, which is Yevut Sultan Selim and Friends versus, uh, well, Monitors. That doesn't end well for the Monitors. But in terms of naval battles in World War I that really contributed to the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, not really. There are a bunch of encounters that show how dire straits the Ottoman Empire was in by the 1910s, like the fact that Mesudaya was even a thing. But, you know, at that point, it's a few ships lost here, a few ships lost there, the Ottomans strike back occasionally, nothing particularly decisive. If there was any naval battles in the region that, you know, I would say manifestly contributed long term to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, you're probably looking at the battles between Greece and the Ottoman Empire in the 1900s and early 1910s, like this, the Battle of Eli, 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 maybe, um, with Georges Averoff leading. Because although these don't result in significant losses to Ottoman warships, they do result in the Ottomans ceding the field, and they're part of a larger campaign, obviously the Greek campaign against the Ottomans, and they kind of both illustrate quite decisively, as well as in some cases in support of the ground operations, actually physically cause significant downturns in the capability of the Ottoman military forces or reveal the shortcomings therein. Um, and the overall impact of those, as much as anything else, set in train a series of events which is just exacerbated by the First World War and eventually will lead to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Although, you've got to bear in mind that in the uh, post World War One period, when Greece tries to go after the Ottoman Empire again, it initially does fairly well for itself, but then overextends, and then the Ottoman Dash Turkish forces, because they're kind of flipping over from one to the other at that point, counterattack and manage to retake a lot of lost territory, but still the Ottoman Empire collapses and becomes Turkey. Shade Bada asks Most retellings of Midway kick things off from June 4th. Why is the PBY sighting of the Japanese transport force and subsequent action on June 3rd given such little mention? Surely the suggestion were caught, the Japanese were caught by surprise on the 4th has to be hyperbole, as the action on the 3rd should have alarmed Nagumo. I understand being alarmed doesn't necessarily change the equation, but shouldn't the narrative be the Japanese knew the Americans were ready for them come 4th of June, and this thereby compounds their failure? Well, there's a difference between what's happening on the 3rd and the 4th. The thing is, the Japanese knew the Americans had aircraft at Midway in terms of the island itself. And so a PBY showing up, that's an aircraft that could be based at Midway. That's not exactly a huge surprise. The thing they weren't expecting was the US carriers to show up when and where they did. Uh, so they weren't surprised the next day when Midway's aircraft showed up for their attack on the Japanese fleet. They were, however, surprised when the US carrier forces, the Dauntlesses and the Devastators showed up and obviously caused just a little bit of an inconvenience. 
And finally, My Mum's Basement Needs More Windows asks, in episode 325 of the Unauthorised History of the Pacific War, they note that the central force under Kurita sailed from Brunei in the south, whilst part of the southern force under Shima sailed from Taiwan in the north. This means both had had to travel further than they would have done had Kurita been part of the southern force and Shima constituted the central force. They did not say why this was done. So, why was it done? Simply put, the vast majority of the surface striking power of the Japanese fleet at that stage in the war was at Brunei. So the centre force came from there, part of the southern force came from there, and additional elements of the southern force, that secondary force that was never able to quite link up until afterwards, was drawn from other places further north. And that that's basically it. You know, the, the Japanese have what is as near enough it makes no difference, the main portion of their remaining strike power in the south, because the carriers, whilst they're based elsewhere, as you will see at Cape Engano, obviously, don't have really a huge amount of offensive power left to them. So the decoy force heads out, the and then the southern and centre forces, the bulk of all of them, has to be made up from the ships in Brunei, but once you've broken off the centre force, which is the main heavy striking force, then the southern force needs a bit of reinforcement. So that means you draw in reinforcements from elsewhere. And that's where these other slightly more northerly based vessels come from. You couldn't really switch that round because then otherwise you'd have this incredibly powerful force, basically, you know, most of what historically was at Surigao Strait and everything that was historically at Samar all piling in from the south on what's supposed to be the, one of the two diversionary arms. And then the centre force is going to be, you know, a few heavy cruisers and destroyers, which, to be fair, can probably scare Tavi 3 just as easily and probably actually chase it down slightly easier, but is just as subject to being attacked by Johnston and um, so forth as any as any larger force would be so that is that's basically just the, the plan you draw your forces from where you can and rearrange them as you need and that concludes this rather extended set of the dry dock thank you very much for listening everybody and i hope to see you again soon in another video see you then